Renegade and Justice in for another program to share constructive information on what racism is and how it works. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning into the broadcast. I hope you are not wasting your time uh, more than anything. I hope that non-white people, victims of racism who listen to this broadcast, get a much better understanding of what the system of racism is and how it works. Want to hop right to it. Uh, our guest uh, for this evening's program, and give the date really quick, Sunday, June 12th, 2011. Sunday, June 12th, 2011. Uh, our guest for this evening's program, uh, she was recommended a longtime listener uh, and investor. Uh, he found out about her book and thought she had a lot of solid information uh, that would be good to share uh, with listeners. Uh, contacted her a while back, and uh, she was willing to come visit with us on the program. Uh, she is celebrating her recent retirement uh, as a sociology professor at Texas State University in San Marcos. She uh, has a new enterprise. Uh, you can check out her website, uh, Hill country cottage gardener dot com hill country cottage gardener dot com uh, she also has written and done a extensive amount of research on racism uh, we'll be discussing her book silent racism how well-meaning white people perpetuate the racial divide uh, joining us live our guest uh, dr barbara Trepanye, uh, Dr. Trepanye, are you with us? I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your Sunday evening with us. A uh, real pleasure to have you on the program. Um, for our listeners who may not have read your book, uh, might not be familiar with your uh, research, could you give them a little bit of background information about who you are and the work that you do? Yes, I'd be happy to, Gus. Thank you. Um, well, I, this work that I did on silent racism was my dissertation, and it was done in the mid-1990s, and uh, it doesn't sound like that long ago, but I went back to school after my children were in college and graduating from college, so I was a little bit older going to school, and I was interested in racism when I got to graduate school. I was at University of California at Santa Barbara. And I wanted to study racism a way that nobody had studied it that I knew of, and that was I wanted to look at well-meaning white people like myself and our racism. And I had a hard time, frankly, Gus, talking my uh, 
committee into letting me do that research because they thought it was kind of silly, frankly, and that we needed to be studying racism in people who were hateful. But I just had this idea that the hateful racism was so easy to see that a lot of people were aware of it, a lot of people were studying it, and we needed to be looking at racism that didn't show up very much. And so uh, I talked them into letting me talk to well-meaning white people. And the people that came, they were all women. I, I studied racism in, in white women. Uh, just to keep it simple, I didn't want to bring sexism into the picture. And um, the women in the study were just marvelous. They were open. They were willing to talk about their own racism. And, and I feel like that's how I ended up getting insights that we hadn't really seen before. So that's what started it. Okie dokie. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm excited. I uh, spent a lot of time reading the book and, and watching some of your presentations as well to hop more into it. Um, before we hop into all that, uh, you are a white person, white female, uh, yes? Yes, I am. Okay. This program, The Cows, uh, context of white supremacy, uh, I use the terms racism and white mm -hmm. supremacy as synonyms, uh, and mm -hmm. I use the same definition for both terms, uh, definition that I use for both terms. Uh, well, I guess I'll say first, I've concluded that we're in a global system of white supremacy. Racism is white supremacy. White supremacy is racism, and the definition I use, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you believe that such a system exists and do you think that definition is accurate? I do believe that system exists. I, I, I would have one caveat because it, in, in my estimation, there is some racism that's not intended. And what I mean by that is people who are oblivious to racism, it serves them, it serves us as white people, but it doesn't mean that we're aware of the system. And, and it's one of the issues that I work hard at is trying to raise awareness in white people who really care about racism. That's the conundrum for me. It's not like all white people are hateful. We're not. Okay. Some of us are just ignorant. Okay. Um, I, I, would, I would assert, number one, I am a black male victim of white supremacy. So uh, to be expected, we'll probably have some uh, areas where we don't agree, which is great. Um, but I think for the purpose of this conversation, number one, we are talking to an admitted racist. Uh, is that correct, Dr. Uh, Trepanier? That is correct. Okay. Um, I have concluded, and, and I think you have the same conclusion in your book, that it is really not relevant whether white people are aware unaware. The bottom line is that all white people are racist, and I've concluded that as well. I've also concluded that the evidence shows, and I mean an alarming amount of evidence, that even these white people who say that they're not aware, once they become aware, uh, they're still working to make sure that they dominate non-white people worldwide. And I mean, uh, we wouldn't be in this problem, we wouldn't be in this trouble if that wasn't true, I don't think. Um, that's my view as a victim. I could be incorrect. Um, but I think this, this will come out as the show goes along. Are white people dedicated, aware, unaware, however, whatever term you want to use, are white people dedicated to making sure the system of racism, white supremacy remains in place? I think it will come out as we go. Uh, I, I have a request. Um, as I was reading your work, I ran across a ton of familiar names, uh, Dr. Joe Fegan, uh, Charles W. Mills, uh, the infamous Timothy Wise, uh, Jane Elliott, uh, uh, Joel Covell, uh, Dr. Peggy McIntosh, uh, Noel Ignatiev. They've all been guests on this program, some of them multiple times. Um, 
So I think I'd like to think of this, we're the advanced class, so hopefully you will be challenged today. Uh, you already know we're going to have some disagreement. I hope it's going to be super courteous and super challenging. I hope that, uh, yeah, I hope that it's a really challenging interview. Um, with that, um, one of the main, the main thing, the most important thing that I got from your book, and this, this goes right to my definition, you in your book assert that one of the main problems as to why we have not replaced the system of white supremacy with a system of justice is thinking that there is a category of white people uh, who are not racist, uh, meaning there are some white people who do not uh, practice racism. And th this doesn't just mean uh, that there are some white people who are not in the Klan or not neo-Nazis or anything like that, just meaning white people throughout their day, they don't do anything to participate in, uphold the system of white supremacy, and that is just not true. I want to read, true. I want to read, this is from page 82, and this is, this is super important. I want to hush and get your thoughts after I read this quick passage, uh, because I've concluded that the confusion in your book, you're saying a lot of white people there, they're unaware, they're confused about this. I have concluded that non-white people are astronomically confused about this, so much so that it's hard for me as a black male to even assert that every single white person is a racist and be taken seriously. So I want to read uh, this passage is 82 and 83 of your book. I want to read this and then have you take it from there and hopefully you can really emphasize why non-white people should totally get that out of their head, that there are some white people who are not racist. Uh, this is 82 from the book Silent Racism. Uh, and I'm, I am going to switch a few terms. I want to say that because some of these terms, um, you, you talk about the importance of words. Some of these words, I think, uh, whether you're aware or not, support the maintenance of racism, white supremacy. So I'm going to switch some of those terms. And uh, I've written this passage out on the page, and people can clearly see. I put in brackets the terms that I, that I switched. Uh, the existence of the not racist category produces in the minds of well-meaning that see that would be one right there well-meaning white people that anyway the uh the existence of the not racist category produces in the minds of non-white people the illusion that there are white people who bear no responsibility for the institutional racism, white supremacy. Yet, silent, refined racism, white supremacy cannot be isolated from the racist, white supremacist practice and everyday white supremacy of white people who produce systemic white supremacy daily, regardless of their recognition of it or their intention to do so. In this way, the illusion that most white people are not racist virtually ensures the perpetuation of the system of white supremacy. Although refined racism white supremacy by definition is not spoken aloud, it would be a mistake to assume that it is of little importance or that the behavior following from it is not racist. Passivity by white people is also important in maintaining the process of white supremacy. It, on it not only colludes with the system of white supremacy, allowing it to operate without interruption, but also encourages it. This is 82 and 83. I did change a few terms. If you read the passage, you'll note that I did change some terms. Can you explain this to our listeners with the most simple terms that you can so that we easily understand why there is no such thing as a white person that is not racist? Right, because we are in a system that benefits us. And when I say we, I'm talking about white people. Um, and, and awareness of it does not, 
does not change the system. Whether we're aware of it or not aware of it, the system is still going to benefit white people. One of the, one of the things that I like to, to clear up with white people, now you need to remember my audience is white people. <laughs> and so that's usually who I'm talking to, and those are the people that I'm trying to get their heads to change. And uh, one of the things I like to stress in that audience is it doesn't matter if what you do is intentional or non-intentional. If it has negative effects for people of color, it is racist. It doesn't matter what your intention was. One of the things that happens, I think, in the white community is that a lot of focus is placed on intentions. Uh, everybody remembers Don Imus and his comments, and his defense was, well, I didn't mean for it to be racist. Well, that doesn't have any, it doesn't matter if you mean for it to be racist or not. If it has negative effects, it's racist, period. And that's really hard for white people to get because white people like to think that, it, that racism is always intentional. So that's one of the points that I like to stress. Um, and the other thing that I think is so important, Gus, is the passivity. There was one woman in my study who, um, oh, I think I asked the question, uh, have you ever done something or said something that you later discovered was racist, but you didn't realize it at the time? And, and this woman said, well, no, because racism doesn't have anything to do with me. Now, that is the height of unawareness. That is a white person who is, has simply got her head buried in the sand and doesn't want to look at racism. That was, she was probably the least aware person in my study. Other white people in the study, and I just take exception to, to your uh, claim that all white people are dedicated to uh, white supremacy. Other white people in the study who had more awareness, if I ask that question, have you ever said or done something that you later discovered was racist? One of the women raised her hand and said, yes, last week. And she, and she explained what her comment had been that was thoughtless. And she said, I realized after I said it that, that it, it was wrong, it was racist. And that's the person that I'm most interested in. Those are the people that can make a difference and that aren't making a difference because they still have this idea that some people aren't racist. And, and that's why I, I make the claim that all white people are racist. We may not know it, but even if we become aware of it, it doesn't mean we're suddenly not racist anymore because we have so much unawareness of what's even racist. And so uh, even people, you know, like Joe Fegan, people who know so much about racism, have areas where they might say something unawarely. And that's where I like to put my attention. Mainly I put it there because nobody else is, is talking about that. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, uh, number one, uh, I did not say that all white people are dedicated I uh, did not say that, uh, and I think people who've oh. heard this program uh, have heard me give that definition. I've never said all white people are dedicated. I said all white people are racist. Uh, the definition says that a global system of people who classify themselves as white. It doesn't say all white people, just making sure we're clear with terms. Um, oh, people who second. classify themselves as Oh, wait a minute. Out. Let, me, let me continue, please. Okay. Um, the second thing, uh, I want to remind listeners, we are talking to an admitted racist. Now, when you assert that white people are not aware, I just want listeners to keep in mind, because you say this is a key component of white people who allege to be anti-racist or race awareness, the term you use in your book, um, that they are supposed to keep in mind this is a long-running problem between white people and non-white people. White terrorism against non-white people worldwide, this did not just start in the last 40 years. In fact, it would have been absurd for some white person to make that comment just 30, 40 years ago that, you know, white people are just not aware. Uh, so, I mean, that I want people to keep that in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. This argument that white people are just 
mindlessly unaware, uh, going through their day, racist jokes left and right, uh, mistreatment of non-white people in all areas of people activity at all times worldwide. This is a relatively new wrinkle uh, in what white people have been saying about the practice of racism, and I just don't believe it. Uh, I think it would be more accurate to say that white people have been practicing racism, white supremacy, uh, from little stuff all the way to snatching penises off black males. They've been doing this for so long, it's on default. They don't have to think about this consciously. And if they mess up, as you point out in the book, other white people will set them straight. Hey, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing as a white person, as a racist. You say that in your book. That's a big part of the reason you say that more white people don't step up is because they know other white people will get on them if they look like they are not going along with the white supremacist script. Well, I think one of the difficulties in this conversation is that when I talk about well-meaning white people, it might sound like I'm talking about white people generally. I'm not. I'm talking about a very small percentage of white people. So when I talk about well-meaning white people, I'm not talking about all white people. There are some well, very hang, hateful, hang on, dedicated... Hang on. What I want you to explain, because this would be helpful. Since you've already said that if you are white, you are racist, can you tell me what is the difference between a racist well-meaning white person and a racist white person that is not well-meaning what is the and specifically what does this quote unquote well-meaning racist do that is different from other white people well the racism is it's not as obvious and it's subversive in other words it's here's an, a good example it's what some people call liberal racism there might be a judge that is going to bend over backwards to try to do the right thing for a black teenager, and that judge might mistakenly think that the best thing for that kid is to get him out of his family rather than leave him in his family. Now, that is racist, but it comes out of a different intention, and that's where I think a lot of focus needs to be placed. It's a different focus than the one you have, Gus. I'm just going to say, you and I are not going to agree on, on some things. Oh, I said and, that. And, I expected that. And so what I'm trying to do is to carve out a niche to talk about these white people who really do care about racism. I think I do care about racism. Well, and I think I'm still racist. Now, what am I going to do about that? Well, the only thing I can do about that is to learn more about racism, have people in my life that know about racism in a way that I don't know about it. I only know about it through books and through talking to people. I can't know about it in the first person. And so I need to have people in my life who share with me about what happens in their lives. And I need to have time spent with people and I need to witness what happens to them and um, and so I'm talking about a rare kind of a white person it's it's I don't know what the percentage is <laughs> that is hilarious that is hilarious um, and I'm I'm laughing to keep from crying as a slave on the slave ship for you to we we're spending all this time talking about racist quote unquote well meaning white people and you just said they're rare in fact I can take a turn from your book. We're spending all this time talking about an inconvenient fact that is moving us away from which what I thought was the most fundamental part of your book. A major part of why we haven't solved this problem is that people are thinking there are some good white people. There are some white people and when I mean good white people, when I say good white people, I mean some white people who are not racist and you said repeatedly that is simply not true the and best so when wait, I wait, on, there, on, wait let, a minute let me, finish, let me finish then i'll let you speak hang on because i suspect you're being defensive right now i suspect of that course you could, i am my god hang, hang on because that's in your book you're not supposed to be defensive that's a part of your racial awareness is to make sure that you're not defensive you're getting feedback from a black person this is exactly what you advocate in the book so please let me finish i am asserting I've t like I said, I've talked to almost 
I've talked to a lot of the people you referenced in your book. Uh, I'm not speaking, you know, as some confused person. My research, you say that white people are not aware? Man, the victims of white supremacy are clueless. Totally clueless. That statement, every white person is a racist. Most non-white people do not, but, and I'm really not even talking to you, I'm talking to my listeners mostly because I suspect you know this. Non-white people are very confused about this. So it really doesn't help to spend, non-white people, it does not help the victims to spend a lot of time talking about quote-unquote well-meaning racists. The thing that the non-white people, the victims, should understand more than anything about white. I mean, we're talking about a fundamental shift in the way non-white people see white people. These people are racist. They could be, quote unquote, nice, well-meaning. They could think, I'm trying to do the right thing by you. But even then, racism, white supremacy shines through, and it's always to the detriment of the non-white person. What I'm saying, I think it makes perfect logical sense, and most of it coincides with what you say in your book. I don't disagree. Okay, well, hang on. My co-host, Justice, she is here. She has some questions. Now, she is 12. She's making every effort to learn about white supremacy. She's watched your video. She's listened to me read from your book. She has some questions. I would appreciate it if you could make every effort to not be defensive and to be coherent. I want you to try to be as simple as possible so that she can really understand all this information that you've collected, because it's great. You have a much better understanding of white supremacy than 90%, 99% of the non-white people I come in contact. And again, I suspect you know that. I'm, I'm saying that for my listeners. Uh, Justice, if you have questions, your line is open. Please go right ahead. Remember, please, Dr. T, if you can be as simple as possible, accurate as possible, and coherent. Coherent. Please don't be defensive. Justice, go right ahead. Who teaches you how to practice racism, white supremacy? Honey, could you say that again? I didn't quite catch it. Who teaches you how to practice racism, white supremacy? Ah, who teaches us? Well, I think the first place we learn no, it is in our family. You. Hang on, uh, who teaches you? Not us, but just you. Who teaches you? Who teaches me? Barbara Trepanier. Is yes. that what you're asking me, hon? Yes. Okay. My parents first, and then my teachers in school, and my friends, and the media. What makes you a racist, white supremacist? Not understanding how racism works. How do you practice racism, white supremacy, every day? I don't know. Could you at least name uh, three ways? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. Could you name at least three ways? No, I can't. That's part of the uh, problem, yeah. Justice. Go ahead. I was saying that's part of the problem. What's part of the problem? Not being able to see it. See what? Pardon me? See what? To see how racism operates in my life personally. Um, Gus, um, I might be incorrect, but I uh, think she's uh, practicing racism. Um, yeah, I think uh, she's practicing racism. 
What what is she doing that? Uh, well, first of all, she's using um, terms that I don't understand. Second, um, she uh, she she said something uh, right right before the other question that I thought that was um, that I thought that she was um, practicing racism, uh, white supremacy. Um, I forgot what she said, but um, yeah. Well, I think I wrote it in the chat room. I I highly suspect that uh, Dr. Trepanier um, is practicing racism and white supremacy. And I suspect she's aware of this. I could be wrong. But she said that I she's agree. not aware I agree. I agree. of how the system works. She said that. She has written a book, a very sophisticated book, mm -hmm. uh, an in-depth study of how the system works. I mean, that is, that is a huge contradiction. She studied this for 15 years and worked with different organizations. So, I mean, that just... Uh, it, it it just does not seem accurate to me. Mhm. Mm um, I agree. Uh, my next question is: What are a few specific ways that your children practice racism, white supremacy? I don't know what they do. You know what, Gus? This just isn't working. I, it's a, it's not a good fit. I don't know what you thought. I've been as honest as I can be in my book. I don't know where the disconnect is between you and me, but this just isn't going to work. And uh, I'm sorry that I've disappointed you. I've disappointed your listeners and Justice, but... Um, I'm just going to have to end the interview because uh, I just don't... I, I can't go on. I am not disappointed at all. This is what I expect. Oh, you're thrilled to death, aren't you? <laughs> white supremacists. This is what I expect from racist man and racist woman. Exactly what I expect from a well-meaning white person. Thank Keep you. that in mind. Yeah. From a well-meaning white person. Uh, okay, then. Uh, of uh, um, um, I forgot what the guest's uh, name was, but um, can I please get in one quick uh, question? Sure. Um, I watched a video where you were explaining how all white people practice racism, white supremacy. You mentioned that you experience greater resistance from other white people that are more racist and further white uh, and uh, further up on what um, you've called the racist continuum. Who do you know that is more racist, pra pra um, who do you know that is more racist practicing racism, white supremacy, better than you, further up on the racist continuum? Well, I don't, I'm not going to say people by name, but I think that on the political spectrum. There are conservatives that want to change some of the civil rights legislation, and I think that's more racist. So I don't know if that's what you're getting at or not, but um, I just don't think this conversation's going anywhere. I'm very sorry, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it now. And uh, I, I really... Um, I'm really disappointed, and I know you're disappointed. I think you're disappointed. You say you're not because you probably wanted to get a white person on here and embarrass her, and you've done a good job of it. So uh, You feel embarrassed? What do you feel embarrassed I feel embarrassed. About? I feel embarrassed. I feel used. I feel like you knew good. You read my whole damn book, and I feel Whoa. like you knew who you were getting on oh this my show. God. Ugh. What I, I am totally now I'm surprised. I'm not disappointed. I'm surprised. Well, How I'm, did I I'm, you? I'm really happy that I could surprise you, and I'm I'm just um, well. What did we do I'm that was leave, incorrect? I'm leaving. I'm leaving the program now, and I you can say anything about me you want to. You can say I'm stupid. You can say anything you want to. I don't care. I just know that I've done the best I can to write a book about racism from the. Um, well-meaning white person's perspective, and I understand that you don't think there is such an animal, but I give up, okay? I give up. 
So, goodbye. Man. <laughs> I told you all that I would much rather would have. Go ahead, Justice. That I that that is what she would. Um. Well, I mean, that is what um we should expect from from uh, white people. Um. That admit um that they are racist. Um. And they practice racism. And like, oh, God. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm I, I'm I'm kind of getting a little bit upset because <laughs> I asked her uh, I believe two or three questions at least uh, for for her to at least name uh three names or three of something and and like she was like oh well you know i don't you know um i i i don't know how my children um practice racism in any ways um uh like uh, my last question about um uh like further up um on the racist continuum uh, my my last question um i suspect she was practicing racism in a silent way because um, she uh, she she just didn't want to um, answer the question, and um, like she didn't want to um, name any names, and you know she she wanted to uh, be silent about it, so silent racism, <laughs> and uh, she um yeah, and, and uh, um I at well at the beginning of the program, um she used the term some racism uh i have no in the heck of um what that means um <laughs> you know um racist and their terms racist and their terms um yeah so uh i don't know what uh some racism means um i suspect uh, she was uh, practicing racism uh by using terms that uh you know uh i don't understand what you don't understand <sighs> Man, oh, man. Uh, this is why I say I would much rather you all suggest white people, right? Like, it's not like I don't think Umar Abdullah Johnson, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, of course, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., uh, litany of other people. I couldn't, I don't have time to name all the folks that non white people I'm talking about who have come on this program and share constructive information. But the top of the page, it says the problem is white people. I would much rather have white people on the program. I'm in a bad mood. I'm not a nice person. I have to struggle to not mistreat non-white people all the time. I would much rather take out my frustrations and aggressions on white people. That, I mean, that's what it's yep. all about. Get at these white... To have a white person who, a well-meaning white person, curse me out on my program, beautiful Sunday. Beautiful son, man. What Mr. Fuller? What did he? White people can show you better than I can tell you. Her performance in the last five minutes—that's everything you need to know about her book. Her saying every single white person is a racist, white supremacist. Her last five minutes—that's all you need to know. She couldn't even name anything that we did that was incorrect. She, uh, and I just—I yep, want this. Yep. I want this entered for the she, record. She uh, couldn't even do anything. I want this entered like, in the like record. Like you couldn't even like answer any questions. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no worries, no worries. She uh, in her book, in her book, she writes about how you, as a white person, white people are not supposed to do what she just did. I just I want to get this paragraph in, and then I'll hit the phone lines uh, to hear you know what folks have to share. Uh, I guess we still need to do news. I won't go to the phone lines quite yet. <laughs> Um, this is page 98 of her book, Silent Racism, How Well-Meaning White People Perpetuate the Racial Divide. Uh, why race awareness matters. And when she says race awareness, she's saying these so-called well-meaning white people who are supposed to learn more about racism so that they uh, can be more refined, so that they're not making blatantly racist statements, saying nigger, calling black people apes, things of that nature. The comparisons in this chapter offer implications for several lines of reasoning. The first is that race awareness increases as information about race issues and conversations with blacks about racism increase. White people, that is well-meaning white people, not all white people, 
who have high or very high race awareness know that they are at times racist. It follows then that they would be less likely to defend against being racist or that they would be colorblind. The three aspects of high race awareness, these are well-meaning white people, are first, an understanding of the history of racism. Second, an awareness of the system of racism and white privilege. And third, an awareness of one's own white supremacy. High race awareness diminishes the need for defenses against being or appearing to be racist. And she seemed to become highly defensive when we said we suspected that she was being racist. And she's already admitted, so this isn't even, you know, earth shattering. She admitted that in the first five minutes on the program. Yes, of course, I'm a racist. Every white person is. Um, defense protect, excuse me, defenses protect the illusion that one is not racist. I'll read that again. She's talking about white people. Defenses protect the illusion that one is not racist. An illusion that is not present in those who have high race awareness. Even data from participants who have moderate race awareness support this view. Therefore, instead of striving to maintain a not racist image, increasing race awareness is a more constructive goal for well-meaning white people. That term just grates on my nerves. She uses it like every page, well-meaning white people. Um, I, I almost want to go back and listen to the whole program again, like right now, because she the, the, do you remember at the end, Justice, when she was saying, I give up, I quit? I didn't think she was talking about just this program. It, it felt like, uh, you know, I'm done with this whole thing. <laughs> like it uh, like I'm just I'm cool being a racist. I'm just I'm sticking on the team. This is as much as I can do. I've tried. Uh, you niggas are not appreciative. I, I mean, it felt like uh, it felt like she was giving up on more than just the program. Um, yes, uh, I did catch that part. Um, also, uh, I just want, uh, um, I just wanted just, uh, to say really quick, um, it's, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it seems like that she was kind of being, uh, defensive <laughs> on, um, on, uh, some of the questions of that we asked, and, you know, just, uh, um, just pretty much just, she was just, just, uh, being racist, and, um, she, uh, and it seemed like that she was, uh, trying to protect, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, people that uh, she wanted to name, because like you know, she knew, um, she uh, knew some uh, people. Um, well, because um, uh, like uh, I wanted her to uh, give at least uh, three names uh, on, um, like uh, on the uh, racist continuum uh, question, my my uh, last question, and. Um, and, uh, yeah, and uh, she didn't want to name um, any of the people. Uh, well, she didn't want to name any of the racist white people because uh, it seemed like that she was trying to protect um, those racist white supremacists. Kind of like being silent, silent racism, of what she calls silent racism. Mm -hmm. It... Man, it when she explained well-meaning white people, I thought, man, this is like the best definition for refined white supremacy that I've ever heard. <laughs> like, uh, which is what I got from her book. Like, I feel like white people, white people who read her book, could easily adopt a strategy that would fool like 95% of non-white people. Like they and they would be saying the whole time, I'm racist, I'm racist and I'm anti-racist. I'm a well-meaning white person. I'm racist. I'm racist. And they would just be hanging out and you would think, oh, this is the best white person ever. Like they, you know, tell me things and they want to talk and everything. And you your suspicion would drop. I, I mean, that is exactly what's supposed to happen. I mean, it was really, in my opinion, 
it was a problem for her that non-white people viewed her as a racist and with suspicion. Like, that was a real problem for her. And were even pointing out things that she was doing that, in my opinion, I suspect she was practicing racism uh, deliberately. Um, she was she was doing the exact opposite of what she suggests in the book. She was being defensive. Um, she was behaving like a white supremacist. Um, that's what I expect. Like, I agree. <laughs> I would prefer that. I would prefer that. Wow. Did you have any any questions that you were? Oh, go ahead. Um, I also uh, wanted to uh, say that um, I suspect that she was uh, getting kind of angry, kind of angry. So uh, you were saying? Did you have any questions that uh, you missed out on asking her that you were really looking forward to asking? Um, yes. Um, well, some of the questions uh, I didn't really want to ask because, um, you know, she was probably just going to say buckets and buckets of words um, that, you know, that I didn't really want to hear. Um, one of uh, the questions, uh, well, well, one of the questions that uh, she already answered was your book, Silent Racism, What is Silent Racism? Um, another one was what feedback have you received about using the word black in your book? Um some other ones that I uh, didn't get to um, was, uh, have you ever been in a tragic arrangement with a non-white person? Um, what criteria do you use to determine how, ra how more or less racist a white person is? Um, uh, well, I've been... Uh, really uh, willing to uh, ask this question for a long time. Um, it's, uh, well, because, um, yeah, uh, so the question was, um, what do you think white people will say or do once President Obama is no longer president? Um, what are the best things non-white people can do to work against Racism, white supremacy. Um, and uh, that's pretty much about Well, I do have more, but um, I'm probably going to. Um, well, I don't want to read them all, but yeah. But uh, I suspect uh, she's not going to come back on the program since um, she was uh, kind of being a little bit uncomfortable and stuff like that. Um, white people uh, do that a lot. Um, and, they, and, like, you know, they, they love to be defensive. Like once, yeah, they just love to be defensive. Yep. Racist. They love to be racist. <laughs> they love to be racist. Mm -hmm. Um Man, mm -hmm. man, oh man. That is great. I mean, I really couldn't have asked for much better. Like, um, the biggest thing that I wanted was for non-white people to understand uh, we there needs to be a fundamental change in the way we see white people. Um, like I said, I would be cool. I, I don't support name-calling, but I would be okay with au fait because of what that word means. Um, it, it To me, at some point, we were not this confused. We knew white person, enemy. Ofe, pig Latin, foe. Back in the day, before they got so refined, we were not quite as confused about what it means to be a white person. That is the one thing, that's the one thing, the huge thing in her book that I just don't hear people saying. A major reason why we do not solve this problem is because non-white people think, believe, some white people are not racist. And it is simply not true. Period. That is the one thing I wanted to get out, and I think her behavior did way more than anything you could read in her book. Uh, her, unless, you know, I'm confused, uh, I think her conduct did way more than anything I could have said or read or, or anything else, particularly the last five minutes. Um, wow. Wow. Any, any, uh, any other thoughts, Justice? Anything else stand out, uh, things she said or... Um, she made my stomach hurt. <laughs> Dang. That's uh, pretty much all I have to say. She just, uh, yeah, kind of tired.
Yeah. It's, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I don't like a uh, racist that um be uh like just be like uh, what she was today. Mm. Yep. 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 I am pleased. I am pleased. Um Yeah, she was she I felt like she was she was making an effort to be right. And I mean, it's all over the book. She she has lines where she's using the term anti-racist um, where she's saying, she has a sentence, I'll read it to you, I'll read it to you. This is a uh, page. Is it, is it in her book? Yes, this is in her book, where she says, this okay. is on page page 117, where she says, okay, she's quoting a white woman, and she says, by the end, I was able to say, I am totally racist at the same time that I am anti-racist. Now, does that make any sense to you? No. I am totally racist at the same time that I'm anti-racist. Timothy Wise. Timothy Wise. <laughs> I've heard this before. I've, I've heard this before. <laughs> um, and and they understand the effect that that has on non-white people. We have been groomed. They have they stuff green mile and gone with the wind and all this this uh denzel washington and uh, man on fire and uh book of eli they stuff all this on us of black people loving being white identified uh they know the effect that that pharaoh winfrey talked about that they know what they've done to us uh so that then they come yeah, I'm a racist, but I'm working against it. I'm anti-racist. I'm in this. Let's let's go out for you know Ethiopian. Come on, it'll be great. Uh, and and they know our guard just goes down. There are some man. There are some good white people. Some of these white. There are some anti-racist. Remember John Brown? They know. They already know the end. Matter of fact, I'll read the little footnote on John Brown, and then uh, if you want to share a news report or what have you, and then I'll I'll check the phone lines. I uh I was tempted but I felt like it would be uh I felt like it would be incorrect but I was tempted to dig through the archives to pull up some some footage to accompany this um to pull up audio to accompany this but I did not. Uh this is on page 13. Uh admitted racist white supremacist uh Dr. Uh, Barbara Trepanier says before this research I had heard of John Brown but could not have told you who he was. I hadn't heard the song John Brown's Body until a black colleague who gave me feedback on this chapter sang it for me. She also informed me that where she grew up, Chicago, all the black children learned the song. That's what I mean. White people are real informed. I mean, minute details on white supremacy. And then they get that information. That's another reason. Don't go talking to non-white. There's no reason you should ever be going and giving white people information like this, ever. You should be asking questions. You should be asking questions, not giving them. In. Timothy said the same thing. Black people come and talk to him, uh, look at his work, give him point. Do not do that. Do not help. Do not help white people. Do not help white people. Um, yeah, I'll I'll leave it there. Dr. T, thank you. I appreciate it. I will see if uh I am correct if you uh came across as being as racist to our listeners as you did to me. And justice. Uh anything else you want to share, Justice? Your tummy still hurting? Uh <laughs> Yes, um my stomach is well, it's it's not racist. Well, I, I mean, um, well, I don't, I don't have any uh, thoughts. Um, but um, uh, my stomach isn't like hurting, hurting, but it's just kind of. It, 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 I just, I just feel kind of uncomfortable from her using uh, those buckets and buckets of words. Um, just her being racist. Um, yeah, my tummy is hurting, but not directly. Mm. Incoherence is common when white people speak. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's going to be my new tagline. I'm just going to shorten it. I'll take that directly from her. Incoherence is common when white people speak. Context of white supremacy. I'm going to take a quick commercial and then uh, we'll be back. Do you have a news report, Justice? Yes. Okie doke. We will take a commercial and uh, then we will come back and do news. I have a news report too, so we'll do two news reports and then we will hit the phone lines. Uh, context of white supremacy. RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas to Europe to Australia to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past. It is our current reality. Be informed. Be globally informed. You should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design that's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8067 or check us out online at trimultimedia.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the couch. This is Justice here at TalkShoe. If you want to learn, listen, understand, and question, go to TalkShoe.com. And in the search box, type in Context of White Supremacy. And then click the second box down below. And then it'll take you right to it. For more information on racism and white supremacy, go to my blog. Just do justicetoday.blogspot.com. And my email address is justice.rwswj at gmail.com. Replace white supremacy with justice. ASAP. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade, Justice. Whoa, man, oh man. Um, <laughs> we. Uh, I was thinking. I was thinking during the commercial that uh, I used to love the response, uh, or not response, but. Uh, the post, Mr. Fuller, on uh, the Counter Racism Radio Network, where he's talking to uh, the white woman. And, uh, you know, she I played it on the program before, I think. I might play it today, maybe. But um, she, uh, he's just, you know, talking to her and, and just using words. I used to love that clip. I used to, uh, I used to listen to it and play it over and over and over again. And, and I would wait until, back when I had quote-unquote white friends, I would wait until they came around and then I would play it. Um, Man, and, and I just – I noted that there were not many uh, audio clips of non-white people attempting to use codification or some aspect of it 
when talking to white people. And I hope, you know, we have been able to provide more of that. Um, I think this might be a good one. If folks out there are doing sound clips, this might be a good one to sound clip a well-meaning white person. Again, talking to a 12-year-old, talking to a 12-year-old, a well-meaning admitted racist. Uh, I also want to make sure I uh, give thanks, hat tip, uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, he did artwork for has done artwork for the program, logos uh, for the really nice logos uh, for the program, uh, and uh, he helped get the MacBook Pro. He suggested uh, Dr. Trepanier. He might be listening in now, um, but he suggested her. He put her information on my Facebook page. I hadn't even heard about her. Um, outstanding suggest See, suggest white people. I'd much rather talk to white people on the program. Um, get me some white people. Put anywhere in the world, white people. Um, but I want to plug his group, uh, GAC Creative Group. It is on Facebook, uh, GAC Creative Group. You can go to Facebook.com uh, uh, and check them out. Um, outstanding material. Um, please support uh, GAC Creative Group. Um, I'm, I will get the web address as well. Um, Justice, you said you have a news report? Yes. Um, yes, I do have a news report. Um, this uh, news report um, from um, was from racism da was from racismdaily.com. Um, it was posted uh, yesterday, June 11th of this year. Um, this uh, news report is just going to pretty much just talk about uh, this white person um, calling uh, um, non-white people names saying that, uh, you know, his, like, uh, him and his black friends, you know, like, we call each other niggers and holes and all sorts of, of those names, um, uh, and, um, and I believe when they say, uh, uh, the word, um, epithet, um, I believe they just mean, uh, name calling, so, um, uh, when I, uh, um, so, like, when it says, uh, so when I read the word, uh, so uh, when I read that word, then um, then it means, I believe, uh, name calling. Uh, the title is Washington National Draft Pick sends out tweets with racial uh, uh, with racial uh, emphasis. The Washington Nationals are monitoring um, are monitoring offensive and vulgar comments made on the Twitter account of Zach Huchins, a short stop the team picked in the 15th round of this year's amateur draft. We are aware of and investigating the, the comments general manager Mike Rizzo said in a statement released through a team spokesman after midnight East Coast time. Rizzo was not immediately available for further comment. Putin's Twitter feed was deleted late last night around the time the Nationals released the statement from Rizzo. It had included rampant. It had included. Uh, it had included r rampant uh, uh, name calling about African Americans made. May, many phrases objectifying women, and at least one name calling uh, used uh, used to describe Chinese people. Chinese people meaning uh, non-black uh, people. Some of the comments included "time to go shit on niggas," and my teacher just told me not to worry about a makeup test because he'll pass me. What what a boss nigga. You can uh, well just um, if you uh, want to see uh, Hu Chen's uh, tweets, um, uh, you can just uh, go to uh, racismdaily.com, uh, go um, to this article, and um, just scroll down a little bit, and uh, you should see a blue um, a a a, 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 a Word um, highlighted uh, here, and then just click that, and then you can see.
see his uh, tweets. Um, Putin's uh, 18 told the Washington Post he felt uh, remorse for making these statements, but he also defended himself as someone who is not racist. He claimed he has lived with a black roommate for the past four years and said he commonly uses the N-word, nigger, among black friends in casual, friendly conversation. Whether whether people think it or not, I'm not racist, Hu Chin said. I'm not a bigot. I've been, I've had a black guy live with me for four years. My closest friends, my closest friends literally are all black. I'm sorry it was out there for everybody to read. That's just how me and my friends talk, including my black friends. Uh, just that uh, little part right there. Um, well, uh, yeah, um, just that paragraph. Uh, and um, I uh, I really have to disagree that, because uh, he says in there, I'm not racist. Um, I'm disagreeing um, because he's uh, calling... Uh, not white people names, um, and uh, yeah, I will have to disagree. Hutchins and infielder the Nationals ch- choose uh, the the uh, Nationals chose in the 15th round out of Lewisburg, a junior colleague in North Carolina. Believes the statements he made on Twitter will affect his ch- will affect his chances to sign with the team. I feel like it's that serious. Hutchins said, "I am nervous." Uh, Hutchins called um, Nationals assistant general manager Roy Clark and apologized. He just said, whatever is on your Twitter is completely unacceptable. I just said, yes, sir. I understand where he was coming from. Um, There's um, three sources um, at the bottom of... uh, the news report, um, and uh, that's about it. That's funny. I'm not nervous at all. I, I want to follow this uh, this uh, individual, suspected racist, uh, and I'm just saying that not to name call. Uh, which, and I don't even like that. Like, I mean, I really, I after reading this and her saying, and I mean, she has a big writer. I read it again today. Um, thinking that there are white people who are not racist, that is a big part of this problem. I really had this thought again. I've had this thought before about retiring that term, suspected racist, because uh, it leaves that window open like, well, maybe, you know, Teddy, I never, we used to, no, Teddy too, every, all of them, no exceptions, every last one of them, all of them. Um, but I do see a utility for the word because I do use suspected racist if I'm not sure if the person is white or not. I use it then, uh, and I use it not to name call. So I do see a utility for the word, but uh, I, I may, I'm going to have to make sure that I'm emphasizing why I'm saying it because it's definitely not because I think that there could ever be the possibility of there being a white person who is not racist as long as the system of white supremacy exists. And I really don't even think that last part is needed. White means racist. That's just period. At any rate, um, I will share a news report later. I think the finals are on today, so we will stay on, you know, unfortunately, until they end. Uh, So I'll read this later in the program. Um, The news report about uh, the movie where there's a black dog named Nigger, uh, that report, it stood out to me because Dr. Welsing told me about this film about two years ago. And she also told me a story about I think it even came up on the program. But uh, I think it did. It did. I think she, she talked about it on the program, but it was on Racism Daily, so I'll share that later. But, uh, yeah, I want to follow that young man because I don't think he's going to have a problem signing with the baseball team. I just don't think somebody, you know, calling some black people a nigger or using the term is going to, uh, you know, mess up his career. Um, I'll I'll follow that. We'll follow this story and see if he has any problems uh, moving on. Do you think this uh, this person is going to have some problems because, you know, he used the term nigger? Um... Mm. 
Maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, I am uh, unsure. Maybe, maybe. Um, well, I wouldn't say, well, yeah, maybe, but uh, you, um, usually white people um, uh, don't get in trouble for that type of stuff. Um, and I suspect uh, this uh, teenage boy um, isn't, uh, um, yeah, uh, isn't uh, refined. His his grand. I suspect he has a grandmother or had a grandmother or two, like Doctor uh, Trepanier. I'm sure they will, you know, codify him. You're supposed to be refined about that. Don't call those niggers niggers out in public like that. Just you know, save that for when you're at home. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's about the size of it. That really is about the size of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I suspect. Yeah. I suspect that. Um, his grandmother or mother or father or whatever um, uh, will uh, will help him refine uh, uh, will will help him get refined on uh, how to practice racism white supremacy and don't uh, use the word nigger or you know uh, don't call black people names while, while you're out and about. Refinement. Refinement. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Um, she cursed at us too. She cursed with a twelve-year-old. She cursed anyway. Um, this yeah, report. She did. She did. And I. <laughs> that was a, such a disgrace. Such a disgrace. Tacky, trashy, terroristic trifling through and through, through and through. Uh, I had to share this on the program. Uh, I was almost going to see if Justice would get her flute. Um, this June 11th, this was just reported yesterday, Rocky Alter Ego, Sylvester Stallone, suspected white supremacist, to join Immortals in Boxing Hall of Fame. Now, I mean, you talk about a disgrace, man. Uh, aspiring authors are always urged to write what you know. It thus probably made sense for a struggling actor and screenwriter named Sylvester Stallone to crank out a story about a down-on-his-luck white boxer who caught lightning in a bottle and proved to the world he wasn't just another bum from the neighborhood. Not that Stallone suspected white supremacist who will be inducted here tomorrow afternoon into the International Boxing Hall of Fame, a non-participant category, ever actually boxed. But just like Rocky Balboa, the South Philadelphia pug he created, hmm, that's an interesting term, the South Philadelphia pug he created, if anybody, you know, is close to a uh, dictionary or online source pug, that might have some racial connotations, racist, white supremacist connotations, pug, P-U-G. Uh, anyway, the South Philadelphia pug he created, he was from the wrong side of the SEPTA tracks, so to speak, and on an express line to nowhere. The chance of Stallone or his fictional alter ego ever hitting it big were probably so long that any Las Vegas odds maker worth his salt would have made either an off-the-board proposition. But the low-budget Rocky, which was released in 1976, won three Academy Awards, including Best Picture, and established a film franchise that, as they say in the industry, has very long legs. Maybe the closest thing which, uh, excuse me, the closest thing to Rocky, which spawned five sequels, is the James Bond series. But six actors have played the suave British secret agent, racist. Try to, I would switch British for racist. I would switch British for racist. Try to imagine any of the latter treatments of the so-called Italian stallion with some other, someone other than Sly in the lead role. Can't be done. Right. Stallone also hit a home run, but maybe not a grand slam with the four flick Rambo series. 
But taken on balance, his celluloid career probably includes more misses than hits. He has made some astoundingly bad choices in the selection of roles that might have established him as something other than a two-trick pony. But whenever the box office take and critical acclaim began to dry up, there was always those old reliables to fall back on. I'll just go on making Rambo, which is very close to Sambo, and Rocky, Stallone, now 64, said a few years ago during one of his periodic lulls. Both are money-making machines that can't be switched off. Now, keep that in mind when you think about the programs, the dialogue we've had about the racism, whites, and I mean, it's in Rambo, too. It's just a white man going to an area and mowing down, killing non-white people by the thousands. Um, cash, money-making machines that can't be switched off. That is an incredible metaphor. Racism, white supremacy is always fantastic business. Uh, I'll continue reading. Uh, but as profitable as the John Rambo character was for Stallone, his heart and the world's is more readily given to the guy who fell in love with the pretty but shy Adrian, the godfather, who made ends meet by serving as a kind-hearted enforcer for a loan shark who was always loyal to his crusty trainer, Mickey, and unaccountable to his schlub racist brother-in-law, Paul, Paulie. Change any of the elements of the original story, which Stallone wrote in only three days after being inspired by Chuck Wepner's failed challenge of heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali. Is Chuck Wepner a white person? Can somebody get that information for me? Chuck Wepner? I'd never heard this before because I just want to see if, that's, if this is a white person. Are, are we to understand that Muhammad Ali, victim of white supremacy, a black male beating a white person inspired Rocky directly? Wow. Wow. A black person who was in the Nation of Islam and spoke out prominently against what? Why? Can somebody get that for me, please? Chuck Wepner. Last name is W-E-P-N-E-R. Chuck Wepner. Thank you. Chuck Wepner's. Um, oh, do you have it? Do you have it? Yeah. Um, it, uh, I see some images uh, of him. He uh, looks like uh, he can be white. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, it looks like that. Uh, he is a white person. Hmm. Do you think you think this is someone who'd be accepted as white? Um. Uh, Wikipedia. Hmm. Uh, uh, I might be incorrect, but uh, these might be some of the images of him. Okay. Do you but, think uh, other? Yeah. Do you think other white people would, you know, accept this guy, the person that you're looking at, as being white? Yes. Okay. Wow. That is fascinating. Now, I almost want to go back and look at them again. That might be another program on Rocky. Wow. That is incredible. And in the Rocky Sea, you heard some of the, oh, I can play some of them. We have, man. Mm -mm -mm. Anyway, um, calls a black person an ape. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you, like, uh, what, what did you type in for Chuck Webner? I didn't look it up because I was still in the process of reading the article, so I didn't want to, I'm too lazy to go to another tab, so I was hoping you all could look and tell me what you all think. Yeah, um, I typed it in, and then it just uh, showed us as images for Chuck for uh, Chuck Whitner, and then it just shows uh, some images of him. Hmm. Of boxing I'll, non-white people. Hmm. I'm gonna. I'll look up. We'll see if we can get more information. We'll look up Chuck Webner. That's there. You go. That's something you all can do. Can you get information? Like, look up. Tell me who this guy is. Um, what was his fight record? Like, any information you can find. Info about the fight with Ali. I mean, uh, yeah, with Ali. Maybe we can find it on YouTube. That would be great. Racial theater. That would be great. Uh, okay, I'll keep. I'll keep. Um, I found. Oh, go ahead. Um, I um I found uh, I believe um. Well, uh, below of what I just uh, well below the images it says Muhammad Ali versus Chuck Webner round fifteen, final round nineteen seventy five. Which that's on YouTube. 
Okay. I'll uh, check I found that, that out. Video. And um, if you uh, go to Wikipedia, um, just uh, type in check. Just type in a uh, Chuck uh, Webner, and then I guess uh, it will give you some information about him. Okay, uh, folks out listening can get information. Uh, I'll finish reading the article, and uh, then yeah, we hit the phone lines. If anyone has that information, I would be interested to hear more. Chuck Webner. Uh, let's, so uh, it says, change any of the elements of the original story, which Stallone wrote in only three days after being inspired by Chuck Webner's failed challenge of heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali, and maybe some or all of the Rocky magic disappears. Hmm. Even Sly himself, it's kind of wild having a white person, suspected white supremacist named Sly. Hmm. Sly himself sometimes is at a loss to explain why Rocky became as integral and enduring a part of a public consciousness as any movie character ever has. Whoa. Now we'll go back and read that again. Uh, what inspired all of this? I'll just read that all again. Uh, change any element of the original story, which Stallone wrote in only three days after being inspired by Chuck Webner's suspected racist's failed challenge of heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali, victim of white supremacy, and maybe some or all of the Rocky magic disappears. Even Sly himself sometimes is at a loss to explain why Rocky became as integral and enduring a part of the public consciousness as any movie character ever has. Upon being told in December 2005 that the Boxing Writers Association of America had selected him to receive an award for lifetime cinematic achievement in boxing, Stallone said he could not have anticipated Rocky's ability to keep going the distance. People accept Rocky Balboa as authentic, said Stallone, who was putting the finishing touches on 2006's Rocky Balboa when told of that honor. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and asked about my boxing career. It's like they really want to believe that Rocky exists. You know, I'm amazed by all of this. At one time, I thought people would get over their fascination with the character and move on. Didn't happen. After 30 years, Rocky has taken hold to a degree I never could have imagined. It's still taking hold. A statue of Balboa, a prop from 1982's Rocky III, might have been viewed with disdain by certain board members of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, whose steps Rocky so famously climbed to the strains of Gonna Fly Now. But so many locals and visitors clamored for it to be put on display there that it was permanently relocated from the about-to-be-demolished spectrum to a place near the base of those steps in 2006. It is now, and probably always will be, one of Philadelphia's top tourist attractions. And just for comparison's sake, the, what they call the Liberty Bell is also in Philadelphia. I am told where they signed the Constitution, Mr. Edward Williams, uh, is in Philadelphia. So, I mean, you have monumental, um, you know, historic landmarks and things in this city of which Rocky is one of the tops. It's, uh, excuse me, but so many, uh, okay, da, 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 da. Stallone is also collaborating with Tony Award winner Thomas Meehan, who wrote the librettos for Annie and Hairspray on Rocky the Musical. Lord. Plans call for the play to be first performed in Germany in the fall of 2012 before debuting on Broadway in the spring of 2013. World system. What could possibly top all that? 
Well, maybe a biographical movie about an even longer long shot than Rocky, namely Sylvester Stallone himself. Next page. Born Michael Sylvester Gardenzino Stallone in the Gritty's Hell Kitchen, Hell's Kitchen section of New York to an Italian hairdresser father and an astro astrology-obsessed mother, the future Rocky was expelled from 14 schools before 13 for antisocial and violent behavior. Wow, if he had been a black male, we would not have Rocky. At 15, his classmates voted him the one most likely to end up in the electric chair. Are you serious? Who even has a category like that in school? White people are crazy. White people are incredibly racist. Excuse me. Much of Sly's defiance was, excuse me, much of Sly's defiant ways were acted out in Philadelphia, where the family moved in the early 1960s or its surrounding areas. He never completed the 10th grade at Lincoln High before enrolling in Devereux Manor High in Berwyn, Chester County, a school for emotionally troubled youth. That sounds like a place for white troubled youth. I don't think they send black people there who get kicked out of school uh, 14 times. Uh, Stallone was homeless and sleeping most nights in New York's Port Authority bus terminal when he accepted $200 for his first starring role. A soft porn movie called The Party at Kitty and Studs, which was released in 1970. He appeared naked in nearly all of his scenes. Wow, that is really interesting. Having determined that writing his own scripts might boost his flagging acting career, Stallone wrote the screenplay and co-starred in 1974's The Lords of Flatbush, whose cast included pre-Fonzie Henry Winkler, in which he portrayed a leather-jacketed, Dr. Welsing moment, 50s tough guy. But a year or so later, it said he had only $106 in his bank account when United Artists executives, who reportedly envisioned Ryan O'Neill in the, in the lead role, greenlighted Rocky, with no expectations that it would be anything close to the international smash that it became. So impressed by Stallone's star-making turn, Sly was nominated for Best Actor and Best Screenplay Oscars, noted Chicago Sun-Times film critic Roger Ebert, predicted he would become the next Marlon Brando, Godfather again. What has followed has been, well, no one compares to Stall uh, Stallone to Brando anymore. One warts and all, Bio of Stallone reports that he passed on the lead role in 1978's Coming Home that went to John Vaught, who won the Academy Award for Best Actor. He also declined the role accepted by Christopher Reeve in 1978's Superman. Are you man? And that's red, white, and blue again. Uh, as well as, one, as, as the ones that went to Harrison Ford in 1984's Witness, to Eddie Murphy in 1984's Beverly Hills Cotton. Wow! That's so interesting. Beverly Hills Cop was supposed to or could have had Sylvester Stallone. I bet that would have been a totally different movie with him. Man, they would have had to change everything. I would love to know what that script would have looked like with a white person in Eddie Murphy's role. He would, it would not have been the clown show that it turned out to be. Uh, where he's acting like a homosexual male. That anti-sexual behavior is in Beverly Hills Cop. At any rate... Uh, and he did the Rocky thing. The connections are, are endless. Uh, and he was also uh, had the opportunity to do Bruce Willis, uh, 1988's Die Hard, uh, and Dudley Moore, 1992's Arthur. Uh, but he signed on to such ill-fated projects as 1984's Rhinestone and 1992's Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Poor decision-making from a white man. White people do not look kindly upon that. Uh, that kind of decision-making played no small part in Sly being nominated a record 30 times for the Golden Raspberry Awards, usually in the Worst Actor category, which he's won 10 times. The Golden Raspberry Foundation named him Worst Actor of the Century in 2000, <laughs> but Stallone could live comfortably off the mega millions he's already banked from the Rocky and Rambo series, with the large checks continuing to come in from residuals, the gift that keeps on giving. 
One of his more recent action flicks, 2010's The Expendables, grossed $266 million worldwide. And as of tomorrow, he joins the company of Sugar Ray Robinson, Joe Lewis, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and any number of boxing legends whose fights were not choreographed. That is an extraordinary embarrassment. And that, that right there lets you know all you need to know about white people's dedication to white supremacy. Sylvester Stallone would not have a career. He'd be a homeless dropout bum if it wasn't for white supremacy. That's the only reason he's been a success at all. Rocky and Rambo, I could not give you two films that better illustrate racism, white supremacy, and white people's undying loyalty to keeping their foot on the neck of non-white people. I'll end there. This is the end of the report. It was kind of long, but I thought that was very interesting. Um, Justice, you have seen Rocky, and you have uh, even played Eye of the Tiger on the program. Do you have uh, any thoughts about Rocky, this fictional character from a movie that is not real being inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame? Uh, uh, just, uh, it's kind of brutal. or well, not kind of brutal, but it is brutal. Um, yeah, the, uh, it, it just really just makes me the chills because, like, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's just, uh, rocky, um, uh, Beats up these black people, and um, and uh, usually the black people lose. And then, of course, um, uh, and um, of course, um, the white man wins. And uh, you know, um, you should, uh, I'm sorry. I, I was snickering again. Snickering again. Yeah, I was snickering again. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, of course, the white man wins, and then uh, all the people cheer for him, and then they all have a, a party and stuff after. Yeah. So, uh, anywho, um, yeah, but um, just uh, just those Rocky films are just very brutal, and um, I think um, they're uh, just racist because um, it's just white people um, beating up black people. Yep. Total minstrel show, total minstrel show. If anyone has seen um, Rocky IV, James Brown, Black and I'm Proud. I need to get that sound clip back. Um, James Brown, again, he's in it, and he's singing uh, Living in America, uh, and it's got Apollo Creed. He's dressed up uh, with red, white, and blue, and he's got a hat on, and he's dancing on stage, and then he promptly gets beaten to death in the ring by a white man in front of his attempted a uh, black female uh, so-called wife. I mean, it's, it's it is some of the worst racism, white supremacy ever. And again, Sylvester Stallone, he'd be a homeless bum if it wasn't for white supremacy. He would be a high school dropout, but most likely to make the electric chair. Did you, uh, man? I'm through. White supremacy is a total disgrace, and this is what we'll have forever until we get it in our heads. Every single white person well-meaning or anything else, anti-racist, every single white person on the planet is a racist and should be viewed as such forever. It is our job to adjust our thinking to that monumental shift in the way we see white people, every single one of them. Uh, just for clarity's sake about the, well, I played it before. Go back and listen to the archives of the Rocky program. Uh, I should have more significance now. I will hit the phone lines unless you have anything else you would like to share, Justice. Um, I don't know. I have anything um, else to share. Um, just uh, white people are the problem. Um, yeah. My stomach is, well, my tummy is kind of hurting still. <sighs> the problem is white people. There are no well-meaning mm -hmm. white people. Um, you have blame refined... them. Blame them. Blame them. <laughs> well-meaning white people. 
Uh, if you are interested in dialing in, the number is 760-569-5767. Uh, and the code is 564-943. So the number again, 760-569-5767. And the code is 564-943. Skype line is open. You can use Skype. This information is in the description at TalkShoe. So, you know, uh, I will hit the phone lines. It's, you know, it would be helpful if you all could press 1 today because uh, there are a lot of people on the phone line. So if you could press 1, that way I'll know the people who want to talk and the people who are just listening at TalkShoe. Um, I'll wait a second or two to see if people will press 1. Um, it would be helpful today. If you can hear me, it would be helpful because there are a lot of people on the phone line. Um, yeah, it would be helpful. That way I wouldn't have to go through all of these. Um, wait a few seconds. Wait a few seconds to see. I'll check the free HD line first while I'm waiting for the folks at TalkShoe to see if they're going to press 1 or not, or I'll, I'll go through. Um, See, the person who dialed in last four digits, 7531, uh, 7531 and non-Mighty Wick. Did either of you two have uh, questions or comments? Hi, this is 7531. I'm just listening. Thank you. For sure. Uh, Non-Mighty Wick, any, any uh, questions, comments? He's just listening. Uh, 3413, 3413. Did you have any questions or comments? Last four digits, 3413. Just listening. Okay. I will assume she's just listening. Thank you all for listening in. Uh, all righty. I'll check the top man. Uh, maybe it's my switchboard. Uh, that could be, or maybe uh, nobody pressed one. Um, I will check the lines again. It would be helpful if you all could press one. That would that would be nice. <laughs> um, that would be nice. Um, okay, we'll go through and check. Um, <sighs> uh, Rise Heru and uh, Lady Baltimore. Did either of you two have questions or comments? Hello, can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay, first off, guys, uh, FYI, you can't push one. I know I pushed one 15 times, and you never caught it, so I don't think you can push one. Hmm. I don't know. I pushed one, and it never said you are in the college queue or anything like that, so one doesn't work. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, secondly, I just want to say very constructive show. Um, I expected her to go off and, like, go off like that, so... I'm not surprised at all, and I've concluded there are no uh, well-off uh, racists in the system of white supremacy. That's all I wanted to say. Well-meaning, sorry. Well-meaning white. <laughs> uh, white supremacy. Well-meaning. I I would, if I had yep. the ability, I would rewind. Sorry, sir. I'm sorry. I'm muting myself. Go ahead, Rise Aru. Oh, no, that, that's okay, Gus. I was just going to agree and, uh, you know, say that there's no evidence to support that there's any well-meaning white people, uh, no matter if they're saying it or not. So I just wanted to add that, and uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Um, while I'm making a request, if uh, anyone figures out the Q button, that would be helpful. I know someone that was – people that have called in before – I uh, have found the Q button, and they've used it, uh, and I asked someone, and they said it was one. Apparently, it's not one, so um, if you all figure out the Q button, let me know, and that way I can tell people, because it would be easier if I could figure that out so I can know which people are just listening and which people actually want to comment. Um, yeah, I, I agree totally, and I'm glad that came through. I'm glad that came through. Um, I wish, man, I wish if I had the ability, I would I would be playing back snippets. Like, I would play back when she said, when she gave her definition for what a well-meaning 
white person, a well-meaning racist does. Uh, it was just refinement. Like that's all she was saying was they don't do the obvious things that you can detect as racist. They do things that are more uh, implied, nonverbal, uh, that are more difficult. To, that's really all she was saying. Did you all catch that? Yes, yeah. I agree. And she was so contradictory in everything she was saying. And, like, when Justice started asking her questions, she was like, who taught you to be, you know, a racist white supremacist? And she goes on to say, my parents, my friends, the media. And then Justice is like, well, could you give us examples how you practice white supremacy? I don't know. And then she immediately got defensive. Like, from that point on, it's just like the stuff hit the fan. Like, I don't know. It was crazy. Yeah, and all of that uh, after you, uh, you you even asked her uh, if she could be as you know clear and courteous and uh, you know truthful uh, as she could, she still uh, practiced racism. Baffled by a twelve-year-old. Oh, yeah, that's funny how she said she felt used. And uh, you, you asked her to explain how, how uh, or why she felt used, and she really couldn't uh, offer an explanation. Uh, but great job, uh, Justice. Very great job. Thank you. Let's see, I'll check some of the uh, other folks that dialed in. Um, Hope someone maybe people can figure out the queue situation. I don't know if they have instructions on that. I would I would appreciate that information if anyone can find it. Uh, when you do my line, Gus, I'll push every button on my phone to see which one it is. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, let's see. Northern. Uh, I think this is Tennessee. Tennessee and East Maryland. Did either of you two have questions or comments? Um. Tennessee and yes, um, Mer Mer Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Both of you. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to you, Gus, and Justice. Um, I have learned quite a bit from listening to your program. Um, I am still learning. And first, I'd like to say um, I thought in the beginning when she was getting defensive, I was thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, gosh, you need to stop. You need to be quiet and let her speak. I had that actual retreat mode, like they're superior. And I, I can't believe I actually had that. Then I thought about it, and I was like, I, I, you know, it needs to be a check. Um, secondly, Justice, i like to ask you, what do you do to learn about racism and white supremacy because I like um, different ways to teach my daughter because she's the same age as you. And at times she's not wanting or she doesn't understand it. So I want I was wanting to know of any examples that you do to keep awareness of racism and white supremacy. Not hearing you, uh, Justice. We're not hearing you. Hello? We can hear you now. Um, can I be heard now? Hello? We can hear you now. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, my question is to you, um, what is it that you do to keep aware uh, of racism and white supremacy? Uh, I have a daughter that's 12, and I would like to, for her to become more aware of it as well. So I was wondering if you had any examples or suggestions. Um, well, uh, of 
how to be aware about racism? Yeah. Um, well, what I do is, uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, let me think. Um, I uh, study um, white people, um, and uh, I use, uh, yeah, um, I just study uh, white people, and um, I, uh, um, I use, uh, like, um, I uh, speak to myself, um, you know, um, I ask questions to myself, um, that's uh, pretty much about it. Using code. Um, yeah. Um, one other question. Um, how did you become aware of it? Were you taught from your parents or family member or friends, or did you look at your surroundings? Um. Well, first off, um, I uh, I knew like pretty much like nothing about it. Um, my uh, parents uh, was uh, the one who introduced me into you know the basics of racism, um, white supremacy, and like uh, I'll uh, like a uh, once. Um, oh, wait a minute. We figured it out. We figured it out. The Q button. The Q button has been figured out. Whatever button you just pressed, uh, Texas, I'm sorry for interrupting, but uh, I want that Q button so I can get it would make my job so much easier. Person in Texas, what button did you just press for the Q? Um, hi, guys. It's um, pound eight. Pound eight? Yeah, or pound. star eight. I went on the, yeah, it's star eight. Star 8. Okay. Everyone try Star 8 and see if that works. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Woohoo! Star 8. That's the Q button. Now my job has been so much easy. Thank you. Star 8. I'll get you. I'm so sorry for interrupting. Um, I'll get everybody. Just uh, please allow Justice to uh, finish. I'm so sorry. Um, did you... Well, I pressed Star 8. Did you see me? Uh, it, the switchboard has lit up. Lots of yes, we I got it. Okay, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, just um, I don't remember where we left off at. Um, yeah, I, I I believe we left off. Uh, yeah, my parents was the one who introduced me into the basics of racism, like supremacy. Um, oh yeah, I was gonna tell you a uh, um a time that uh. Um, once, uh, my, well, when I was, uh, younger, you know, a, uh, a, a child, well, I am a child now, but, you know, well, when I was younger, um, I used to, uh, um, like, I used to, like, point things out to my, uh, dad, and, uh, like, uh, he would, um, like, uh, he would kind of say, well, you know, uh, 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 Justice, let's, uh, you know, stop talking about that because, um, you know, white, uh, white people have uh, trained us to, you know, um, you know, not talk about white supremacy, racism. Um, but, uh, you know, now that uh, my dad and I and, uh, you know, uh, my mom got older, you know, we sort of just, um, uh, my uh, dad just started just, uh, just studying um, he, uh, read Mr. Fuller's, uh, book, um, he, uh, yeah, um, and, uh, that's just, uh, well, I don't really want to go, uh, into the whole story, but, um, just, uh, yeah, my, uh, dad, um, introduced me into, uh, racism, and, um, you know, as, he got older. Um, uh, he told me, you know, this it's fine to talk about racism. 
uh, to him uh, while I'm out and about. Um, you know, just uh, don't be afraid of, you know, um, talk about racism. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Sounds good. And then I'll let you get to your other colleagues. Um, how do you counter feeling inferior when she was getting defensive? I felt like I wanted to kind of take up for her, and she's the one that's harming us. I am a, a black female. Okay. Um. First, I want to thank you for that question because it re- it reminded me. Uh, I am so glad that you mentioned that because that happened. I think that happens to all of us. That's my suspicion because it still happens to me. Uh, I shared about this on a recent program. Um, I was watching Sinbad. I mean, <laughs> this wasn't even anything <laughs> that serious. This was, you know, just stupid minstrelsy on television. But he was talking to a white person. Uh, it was it was a white person in a store and the white person was talking to a black female and he was trying to give her get her to buy some stuff. And he said, you know, hey, don't be trying to get her to waste her money. You know, do, and I felt like, whoa, what? don't you talk to that white man? That, and this is Sinbad. This is stupidness on television. It's all of us. We've been conditioned uh, to be that way. And white people know this. Um, what I try to do is to be I'm honest with myself. That's number one. I have been victimized. That's a part of the victimization. Okay, when this happens, uh, I'm going to recognize this as my programming, and I'm going to fight against it, even if it's difficult, even if I feel nervous, even if I feel like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. You know, you're talking bad to that white person. Leave that good white person alone. Leave that good white woman alone. Uh, this is a racist. That is first and foremost. You're ta- this is the problem right here. This is exactly what you should be doing. Um, do not resist, do not fall to that temptation. Keep in mind you're talking to a racist, uh, and you should be able to ask them questions courteously. Uh, and um, I think Dr. Cambon, he says that we all have uh, a little whitey inside of us uh, that's directing our thoughts and speech. Kind of the, That's the person, that's the voice that speaks up You know, when you're doing something that might upset white people. Uh, I try to minimize that voice, and what I try to do, listen to people like Dr. Cambon, uh, non-white people who are less confused and are active against racism and white supremacy. That kind of helps me keep uh, that white person in check, um, get it, staying informed, like just their behavior. Like keeping, I watched, I would read a little bit, and when I took breaks, I watched Africans in America, phenomenal documentary on PBS. You can get it at the library. You can watch it online. Uh, and it just talks about the brutality um, that white people have heaped on us for forever. Uh, and when I keep that in mind, uh, I, th- I think I made a reference to uh, their conduct on the program, uh, the castrations. Just keeping their conduct in mind helps me minimize that. Like, no, these people treat us with total disregard. They treat their dogs better than they treat black people. When I keep all that in mind, it helps me have that uh, – that healthy dislike for white people that really helps me keep a lot of that in check and uh yeah not uh, not back down not back down and just ask questions you know this is this is what we're supposed to be doing and listen to mr foe that was helpful too hearing him talk to white people and not be afraid dr welsing any non-white people who are talking to white people and they're not scared they're not afraid they're standing up eyes on the, that's why dr welsing i think she always recommends eyes on the prize because it's i feel like it's so rare to see a non-white person to see a black person making sense when they talk to a white person and you know get accurate information and calling out you know them for the racism white supremacy it's so rare to see that that when i find other non-white people doing it i try to i try and keep that material around me uh, just to uh give me an example and give me uh give me some sort of standard you know about how i should be conducting myself with white people um those are some of the i hope does that does that make sense it does, and I have listened to just about all of Neely Fuller's archive um, from your show, and listening to him daily really 
helped me become less confused. But I am still very confused, and, and that's why I couldn't believe that I I felt sorry for her, and she was the one that was cussing at justice, a child. I think she wanted us to feel sorry. I'll be quiet and let the other folks, but I think she that's what she wanted when she was saying she was used. Like, that's a standard ploy from white women, that I'm being attacked. The niggers are mistreating me. I'm being attacked. I mean, that's, that's, they, that's standard racist code. Standard racist code. I've seen that at least, at least personally four or five times uh, from white racist females. <laughs> they, uh, they do that. It's, uh, they try to use that as a, you know, like you say, to get you to drop your guard and, and to revert back to programming. Um, I think uh, one way to help counter that feeling, and you know, thank you for being honest uh, that you that you feel that way because that's we, we we all got that in us, um, and, and it's there because white people put it there, and so just uh, working against that, you know, trying to minimize uh, that 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 feeling to want to protect them or help them. Uh, works against white people directly and work, and works against their system. So just knowing that you're trying to uh, consciously combat that within yourself, uh, to me, um, it, 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 it can motivate a person who's trying to do that because they know the more they turn that down, uh, the more they work against that, uh, the more they are working to get rid of white supremacy too. So. Um, um, uh. I just kind of wanted to uh, say um, quickly. Um, uh, the uh, listen, uh, the caller that um, just asked me those questions. Um, are you still on the line? I am. I'm still here. Okay. Um, uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, give a suggestion. Um, I think uh, you should, because uh, well, since you said that you uh, have a daughter, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, you should, uh, well, when we have the next children's uh, program, uh, we, um, well, you should um, uh, get her uh, on the program. I don't know. She was actually on, Robin and Roland. They were on, but she's not um, actively seeing it. She's not actively aware of how deeply rooted it is. So that's why I was trying to get some suggestions um, that can help her a little bit more to understand because I'm 30 and I'm just now figuring all this out. And if I can help her at 12, um, I think that will be very beneficial for her. I have one suggestion, and that, let me preface I do not have children. I do not have children. However, um, we had some victims of white supremacy on the program in September of 2010, and they do have children. And they said that they showed their children um, just, you know, <laughs> honesty. Uh, they just gave them, you know, some videos on, like, the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King Jr., and they said it clicked immediately. All of their I think even at a five-year-old, and she said that when they watched those videos, and some of it talked about mistreatment of so-called Native Americans, they got it immediately, and they immediately connected white people racist immediately. Uh, they didn't even have to say much. Uh, they said it was instantaneous. They made that connection. White people harm to non-white people. Uh, I think like Eyes on the Prize. Those videos have they have they uh, seen those videos like the Eyes on the Prize collection? They have not. I would highly recommend showing them that because, oh, I mean, just to see, I mean, you don't even have to say anything. You can just sit back and let them see the history of white people so that, they, I mean, that will, man, I think that will do a lot because I think, I don't know if Justice, if she's seen Eyes on the Prize, but I know in preparing for this program, she has seen and been in contact with material like that, where she gets to see how grisly uh, racism, white supremacy is, I think that makes it real clear. That makes it real clear when you get to see how ugly all of this is. Um, it just, it really helps to drive home how serious this is, I think. Another thing I think is, is important, too, uh, is that, um, you know, with children, with offspring, they, they see so much. 
you know, so there's there they come in contact with a lot and hear a lot. And so one thing I do is that I I, I really try not to miss um, an opportunity because the way I look at it, white supremacy signal is being broadcasted 24 seven. And so they're they're very receptive to it. They're going to see it. They're going to it's going to be uh, it's going to be they're going to be saturated in it. And so I really try not to miss an opportunity to identify, you know, to, to help them see what they're looking at when it comes to uh, pretty much anything, anything that's in entertainment. Uh, just I mean, I, I even point out stuff, say, hey, you know, in this area of the world, at one point in time, there was no white people. So all these white people you see, they're here because they had to mistreat some non-white people in order to in order to secure that. You know, and just explain that, and uh, you know, I, uh, you know, just uh, try to give as much information as possible to where, um, not not too much time is going in between when when they are um, you know, getting connected uh, uh, with the system of racism uh, to the things that they're seeing. You know, uh, trying to always maintain that uh, context for them. I think that helps. I think the an important thing, um, and this is just pointing out one person, um, teaching your children that Abe Lincoln was a was a white supremacist um, before they and indoctrinate all this stuff in your in your head about being about him being the great liberator, you know, and all this BS. Um, you know, you make sure that you set straight with your kids. Um, show show the quote from the from the Lincoln Douglas debates of uh, 1858. You know, I never intend the Negro to be anything but, you know, subservient to the white man. And, you know, just show them that and, you know, say, well, why would white people be hailing this person as a great man? Teach them the truth about Thomas Jefferson. I mean, teach them the truth about all of the so-called uh, founding fathers and, and all these people that white people say are so great. And um, they uphold them as, you know, <laughs> justice, and, you know, and just have your kids really critically analyze that because I think that would make it just click immediately. Like, if I had access to like specifically the Lincoln um, Douglas debate of 1858, you know, while we're singing "Lift Every Voice and Sing" in the second grade, I was like, you know, this is, this is buffoonery, like this is garbage. Like, why, why are we singing this? So, and show them the money, show them the uh, the uh, dollar bills. You know, look at these white people on it. You know, why you think that is? <laughs> you know. Rosewood, Roots, I mean, uh, read the news to them. Show them what white people have done and, yeah, and show them what they're doing, too, so you don't have it, you know, to where you know, what white people are doing right now, uh, worldwide, to, to maintain their dominance. Then you don't have the confusion about, well, you know, this stuff happened, you know, 300 years ago. D at the Reckless 2.0. I was just curious if you could share uh, your thoughts on uh, our guest, uh, admitted white supremacists. Um, I guess her, uh, what might be labeled her refined practice of white supremacy, your observations from the program, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Oh, I was outside <laughs> doing some, some gardening when uh, she was uh, talking about, uh, I guess, racists who are more refined, and I'm just outside, and there's, like, you know, a lot of people outside, and I'm just screaming at the top of my lungs, like, refinement, <laughs> refinement. Like, this doesn't mean that this person is well-intentioned. Like, that's, no, it was illogical to me. And then also, I, I don't know, I think I'm, I didn't feel sorry for her as she departed from the phone, but I guess it's still a bit of white identification. I was disappointed because, you know, when I read the show description, I'm like, okay, this white person, you know, this, this is honest. Like, you know, I don't, you know, I didn't expect her to come on the program. And, well, I did, but, you know, still, you know, kind of disappointing you come on the program. If you have all that great information and then, you know, you just practice racism on the program. I mean, but it illustrates the point, like, brilliant. Kudos to you guys and justice. I think is uh this this is a uh, not mighty wick. I was just gonna say I think it's important to note the language she was using uh, early in uh, to try to to try to I guess define uh, why 
uh, there's work for her to do. I mean, she started when I was hearing, hearing her talk, it sounded just like anybody else that needed to justify or to, you know, explain why they're going into business. You know, and she started talking about she cat she she carved out a niche, you know, of these insignificant number of white people that uh you know now 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 she get to work with, <laughs> you know, and um yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's very much a business, you know. I've seen it, I've seen it uh, many times. Um, there's some white people every now and then they'll admit to it that uh you know white people. I think one white lady, if I quote her right, she says, "You got white people, uh, racist, uh, making money off the backs of uh, non-white people." And uh, and that's basically what what she's doing. I also thought it was interesting because her, like uh, most of the other uh, white people, um, took issue with the part of the definition about white people being dedicated. I'm I'm pretty sure about eighty percent of the white guests that you've had on the program have taken issue with the word dedicated. Um, and you know, if white people weren't dedicated, then the system would not still be here. Because then that would mean that they would have the will, um, since they already have the ability. Then they would have the will to do justice. And, you know, clearly that's just not true. So even through inaction or omission. And I suspect that's not even what it is. I think that they're you know, still uh, actively maintaining and uh, expanding white supremacy. Um, you know, that they're still, uh, you know, they're dedicated. They have to be dedicated. I think an important thing to note, too, is just that um, part of, at least, I, I watched the, the video uh, that she had, too, that I think it was on... Um, I don't know. I forgot what it's called. One something, but it was she was another racist with short hair that was interviewing her or whatever. But anyway, I think part of her, part of the lady who was on the races on the program today, part of her, part of their strategy. And I've heard other so-called anti-racists uh, talk about this. Uh, but part of their strategy for the white people is to uh, so-called try to get close to or quote unquote be, uh, befriend uh, non-white people. You know, or so-called, you know, they'll use the term people of color. That's like they'll 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 talk about it as if that is part of their process for trying to become less racist. You know, like it's a need of theirs in order to, you know, I guess to show other white people to some degree, say, hey, look, you know, I'm less racist than you because, you know, I'm, I, I'm OK with hanging around black people, you know, two times a year or whatever the case may be. But um, just I hope non-white people never get fooled by that, you know, because it, it can come across real slick. You know, the white people come around and get to talking like. You know, they want to be your buddy or, you know, they are, uh, you know, really interested in in, uh, in your view and, and, and things of that nature. You know, just ask a whole lot more questions than uh, than statements, you know, with anybody like that. Really, really anybody. But don't do not help these white people out because they're, they're definitely looking uh, to do recon to sharpen their refinement. The people who called in, um, I'm just opening lines up. <clears throat> Uh, Lady B. Moore, your line is open. Uh, 818, your line is open. I think I might have missed someone. Oh, speakerphone, no speakerphone. Uh, I think I might have missed someone. Just I think it's star 8. That's what they said to press. If you called in on talk show and you want to talk, I think they said star 8. Star 8, maybe. Um, yeah, try star 8, see if that works. Oh, uh, D, I got you as well. D, I got you back on. Um, so I'm muting my line. Um, everybody who called in and pressed to be in the queue, your line is open. Good afternoon. Can I be everybody. This is, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hi, this is A One Eight. I just wanted to say I wasn't disappointed. I actually found her behavior to be amusing. Uh, it reminded me of the white woman in the movie Mandingo, where she was setting the black male up to be her victim, but she was telling him how she was going to make it like she was his victim and have everybody believe her. And that's what that woman's behavior reminded me of today. I would not have been surprised if she started crying and going into theatrics and tears. Um, I recently had a chance to work with a racist woman and learn firsthand how manipulative racist women can be. So it, her, her behavior didn't surprise me. And I also, I didn't like that she was insulting our intelligence having written a book about how white people practice racism and then feign ignorance as if she couldn't think of ways that she practices it. Like in doing that, you never examine yourself, you know. So I mean, it, it was amusing. 
in in some ways informative in another, just so you could see how they get down. But you know, yeah, constructive. Do that all the time. I yeah, do that all the time. They um, you know, they can think, I guess, abstractly. But when you ask that white person specifically what you're doing, I mean, I think we've had three white people come on our program and say that all white people are racist. But then you, when you ask what specifically are you doing, um, oh, well, I try not to. Oh, what? What specifically are you doing? I, I don't understand. I mean, just be honest. Be honest. I mean, you're already a racist. I mean, it's the least you can do. Get shot. Can I be heard? Yes. Okay. I was going to say about the whole um, how do you expose your children to it. I don't have children either, but I do feel like in some of my um, or some of my less confused times that I have been childlike, not wanting to see it when it was sort of blatant in my face. So I just feel like to your children, you shouldn't hold anything back. I know a lot of times uh, parents try to protect their children and say, well, I don't, I don't want them to see color and this and that, but the bottom line is white people always see color. We're the ones who try to be uh, diversified, if that's even a word. That might be incorrect. Uh, and try not to see color, but they're always going to see color. So I just feel like we shouldn't hold anything back. Anytime you see something racist, um, practicing white supremacy, then point it out. Just let them know. And that's all. Uh, caller in Massachusetts, your line is open. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes. I just wanted to say job well done, job well done. Um, great program. Um, didn't feel bad at all. I, was, it was, I like like the other caller said, I was, I was amused by it. Um, job well done, Justice. Um, yeah, that, that's about it. Thanks. No problem. Oh. Did you uh did you all catch the uh the used comment that she felt that she had been used and embarrassed? Yes, I heard her say, "Oh, you were hoping that that you would get to embarrass a embarrass a white woman." And this, and I'm thinking there would be nothing to be embarrassed about if you just be honest. I mean, your behavior right now should embarrass you. You wrote a book on how white people practice racism. Now you're acting ignorant, like you don't know. That should be embarrassing for a grown woman. We didn't have anything to do with that. She decided she would play those games. But, again, the standard trick is to try to turn it back around on the non-white victims and make you feel like you're victimizing them. Oh. Uh, can I be heard? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Okay, yes. yeah, I was, I was just going to say yeah, I agree with not with, uh, Ebony. Very standard. And, two, it, I think uh, she by the time she... She was very uh, calm inside, I bet. You know, on the outside, she tried to act like she was flustered, but inside, um, you know, she had a, that was that was her uh, entry into the process of trying to get off the phone. You know, she was going to throw that stuff out. Yeah, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm, I feel like I'm used. So now that's my justification for, you know, running out because the conversation is, is I didn't expect these people to be hitting me with questions that sound like they, you know, maybe poking holes in my uh, in my racist logic. You almost seem like Tim Wise. Like, you know, she wanted, you know, kudos, you know. You're doing a good thing. I mean, because, I mean, at the point, at that point in the interview, I mean, I believe they had, you know, uh, Gus and the caller had, I mean, the guest had maybe two disagreements. And um, she said, you know, 
know, that she suspected that they were going to disagree on some things. And, you know, just around, and I'm not even sure the disagreement that I guess did it for her, but I knew as soon as uh, Gus put justice on the line, I knew she was done at that point. Which, in my opinion, that's uh, that's how it should be. You know, they should either be revealing truth or disappearing, you know. I mean, I mean I, them disappearing is still, them disappearing is still, uh, you know, revealing truth. So, yeah, either way, I mean, it's, you're going to stay and be honest or you're going to be, you know, practice racism and, you know, be honest through your practicing of racism. Um, I think either way is constructive. The person who called in on the free HD line, um, last four digits, 8536, 8536, did you have a uh, question, comment? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Yeah, this this call not only reminded me of Tim Wise, this reminded me of Dr. Terpstra, uh, Change Seeker, or any of the quote-unquote anti-racists. See, it's like, yeah, they'll write these books, they'll say these things, but however, you know, apparently in their minds, you're only supposed to equate other white people as being racist. You're not supposed to take their own words and question them. In other words, it's all right for you to say the guy that owns Chimp Out is a racist. And he admits to being it, and he's honest about it. But her, when she admits to being one, it's just supposed to be that, and you're supposed to give her kudos. Likewise, Jensen and all these other people, you're supposed to give them kudos for that and let it go. You know, so... Uh, and I like the other call that I did uh, find it amusing also. And also I'm so glad you brought up Rocky. Because I live in New York, and New York is where the Boxing Hall of Fame is. And I knew, and I knew in December that he was inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. And when I saw that, I thought this is a joke because they read it, they, you read articles and his names were right next to Mike Tyson, Julio Cesar Chavez, even this other white boxer who was a real champion. But they're equating, like you said, a fictitious, movie character with these real life black Latino and some white champions. And Stallone is being dishonest when he says he's surprised and doesn't understand why people come up to him and take this character as real. Now if, if he honestly felt that way, do I? I say he's, you know, being being a racist and practicing fine racism. If he would felt that way, he would have turned down that honor today. But he didn't. He accepted it. He knew he never fought in the ring. He never knew he, he know he didn't do any of these things. But he felt that, you know, these 
my white brothers are honoring me, and I can't disappoint them. But he's not going to say that. Instead, he's going to make some I'm not worthy Wayne's World type speech. So, come on. And think about it. There are no statues of Melchick Taylor. There are no statues of Joe Frazier. There are no statues of Larry Holmes, all Pennsylvania champions. But there's a statue of this fictitious character that you are allowed to see in the street. And we also need, and that's another thing we need to point out to two non-white black children or other children of color. Point out this blatant hypocrisy when they want, you know, when they see how black athletes like LeBron James are treated for doing nothing wrong, honoring his contract, but deciding he doesn't want to play for Cleveland. He wants to go to another team. He somehow becomes the worst person in the world. Or the uh, black baseball player who, I don't know if you heard about this, in April, he, he, his team, the Boston Red Sox, played a game with the Los Angeles Angels. Some white people on the Los Angeles Angels wanted him to play for their team. He decided not to. When he came to play, they decided, while he was on the field, to throw dollar bills. You know, as if he's some sort of stripper. Or they're showing that, like, he's disrespecting them. You know, he doesn't have right to make his own decision. Point that out to children as well. Um, just wanted to hop in to uh, open up uh, Pam, co-author of Black Love is a Revolutionary Act. Your line is open, uh, California. Your line is open as well. Uh, greetings, Pam. Uh, 909, if that's you, greetings. Greetings. Uh, you know, we say we're supposed to hit star eight. I think that's what they said. Your line was, I saw it. I was just waiting for yeah, a moment to open it. Oh, okay. It worked. Oh, it worked. okay. You still have to activate it. Okay. It doesn't do it automatically. Okay, I got you. Um, I just uh, wanted to add that uh, I thought that the comments of the last caller were excellent as far as pointing out real-life examples to your children because kids are a lot smarter and a lot more perceptive, and I think we've done a lot of damage over the generations of having black children see things that don't make sense that are hurtful, but black parents and black adults just remain silent. You know, uh, Jews don't do that. They don't tell their kids... Uh, Oh, I don't want to teach them about anti-Semitism. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, I'm using the terms that they use. I'm not saying that's a legitimate term. I'm just saying they don't go around saying, well, I don't want them to make up their own minds about anti-Semitism. They don't do that. So, uh, But I have noticed uh, one other thing, too, is that white people really have no heroes. And that's why they have to make up fictitious heroes. When you think about it, they have no heroes. They don't... Uh, they make up. They make Elvis, a dead man, into a hero. They make a movie star character, Rocky Balboa, a hero. They go back to shows like uh, Happy T- Happy Days or Good Days. What was it, Happy Days? As a way of of uh, soothing themselves about about the past, when no black people were really uh, on any level equal to them or around. So they constantly have to create. Well, I guess their whole history is a fictitious her- history, though. So. I guess we shouldn't be surprised that they make up their own heroes, too. And the bottom line is white supremacy, white supremacy, white supremacy. And if they have to lie, cheat, steal, kill, fabricate, that's what they're going to do. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Pam, for acknowledging my comment. And, and, uh, mm-hmm. and another thing we need to say, uh, today, for example, uh, Gabrielle Gifford, they showed the photos of her coming out of the hospital. Uh, we need to point out, I said, point these things out. Uh, 
if you remember after she was shot, you had all these white politicians, white TV people saying we need to tone down the violent rhetoric, stop the uh, stop the gun talk, stop. Let's be more civil. But then less than two months, situation in Libya came, and immediately these same people said, oh, we need to send the military to Libya. We need, we need to do uh, no-fly zones. And, and you point out to your children, whether you like Gaddafi or not, no Libyan attacked one person in this country. So why, if these same people said, no, you know, stop the violent rhetoric, why would they, why would they then all of a sudden say, let's go attack some Libyans? Again, because the African nation and those aren't white people. Oh, and incidentally, uh, the guy, yeah, and like I said, the most important fact, they're not white. And incidentally, the guy that shot Gabby Giffords has been declared unfit for trial. So essentially, he doesn't have to answer for his crime. And now, now does that bother these saints? And also point out, these same white people, they don't seem to be mad at that. Six dead people, 13 injured, that eulogy over that little girl, don't seem to bother them. That judge can declare this guy not fit for trial, therefore not responsible for his actions. Good point. They're not angry at him at all. You know, that means nah. no, no hostility. And he's almost been be- become a, a semi-sympathetic character. Well, he's crazy. You know, he's he, he didn't know what he was doing. He can't stand trial, you know. I mean, but, but it's, it's it's like Gus uses this phrase all the time. It's to be expected in a system of white exactly. supremacy. And we better start preparing our children uh, because I frankly think that it's getting worse. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily getting worse. I think it's becoming resurgent. I think the so-called surface tolerance, which was never acceptance. We've never been accepted. We've never been assimilated. We've never been integrated. We've only been subjugated. And it's time we learn the difference that if you're not equal in a, in a white supremacy society, then you're not equal. So we have to learn to teach our kids the difference uh, that, uh, that this has always been there, but now with the economy being bad and, and white people feeling lost on so many levels, uh, it's becoming more acceptable for them to express themselves in racist, openly racist ways. So it was always there. It never went away. You know, it was always there. But now I feel like it's, it's, they, feel, they feel more comfortable because it's obviously black people are being targeted as scapegoats. I mean, constantly uh, negative articles, constantly, you know, Obama's in office for that particular reason, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, all these negative movies, all this imagery, Planet of the Apes, you know, they're literally using us as a scapegoat, so we better be prepared and understand that these people are going to show their true faces. I wanted to check to see if uh, the person who called in from California, um, were you just listening or did you have a question or a comment you wanted to get in? I was just listening. Oh. I'm just listening. Oh, okay. okay. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, person from Cleveland, did you have a question or comment? Person from Cleveland? Just listen. Group. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ank Amin, did you have a question or comment? Okay, I assume he is listening. I think they said it's star eight for the folks that are dialing in star eight, I think if you want to uh speak uh, and I can get your line. Did you all think uh the admitted racist uh when she uh when she had her uh, profane outburst, did you all think that that was uh a charade to try to get sympathy or do you think there was some 
uh, genuine uh, frustration? Uh, I actually think it was both. You know, uh, like I said one, two, uh, get sympathy because, like, how dare you? Like, how, like, you know, you're not supposed to talk to me this way. And, and like I said, the, the, the hysterics of it, you know, the idea that she could then turn around and say, oh, you just wanted to embarrass a white person? Or you got, you know, you got your wish. And I don't remember you saying that that was what you wanted to do. But, you know, her, like I said, she just revealed herself for, uh, what she is. And then what she'll, what she'll probably do is go on another show with a black host that she knows will not ask her the questions that you just asked. And that will, uh, that will make her feel better. Also, the term uh, pug, from what I understand, it's short for pugilist, which is, which is another word for boxer. And another way you know Stallone was, like I said, practice, practicing racism. This guy, Chuck Wepner, he's known as the Bayonne Bleeder. Now, if you're a smart person, if you're a logical person, you would not want to idolize a boxer known as a bleeder. Because that means he can't take a punch. But apparently, he found it okay, I said, to immortalize a guy known as the Bayon Bleeder and yet demonize Muhammad Ali at the same time. Apollo Creed, I guess just for anyone, if you watch the first Rocky that was nominated for three Academy Awards, three Academy Awards, um, the one three. If uh, thank you, one three Academy Awards. Um, if you watch that film, the character uh, Apollo Creed. If you watch it with that in mind, that this is supposed to be a caricature of Muhammad Ali. Uh, that scene I referenced. There's a white guy in the bar who says uh, we don't have any real champions. All we got is this jig clown. That to me says a lot. Uh, what this person, what he thinks about Muhammad Ali, victim of white supremacy, what he thinks about black people in general, which I mean that comes across all the way through in Rocky. But I mean just that one line. All we got is these jig clowns. In regards to the racist who was on the program today, um, and if you know that was authentic or you know her her her. Uh, emotional display, if that was authentic or uh, uh, calm, cool, and, and on purpose. I look at it, I mean, she's been practicing racism for, you know, probably w w way before I was born, you know. So she got a lot of practice at deceiving non-white people. And so I think she kind of felt, hey, well, it doesn't seem like I got control over this conversation, at least to the level that I want. And I think, uh, you know, that was a move to try to uh, exert uh, uh, some level of, uh, of control uh, uh, in her favor. You know, uh, that's what I think she was uh, attempting to do. I think she lost the refinement. I don't even think it was frustration. I think it was straight hostility. I mean, like I said, I could have could have read that incorrectly. But. I think white people are so used to being accommodated by black people that when they're outside that, that circumstance that they're used to, they don't either know how to deal with it or they just don't want to deal with it. Excuse me. Thank you for pointing out my error. This film was not nominated. Rocky was not nominated for three Academy Awards. Uh -huh. It was nominated for ten Academy Awards. It only won three. 
but it was nominated for 10, including Best Writing, Screenplay, Best Sound, Best Music, Best, A- Best Music, Eye of the Tiger, uh, Best Actress, Best Actor, uh, Best Actor in Supporting Role, uh, Best Actor in Leading Role, Best Picture, Best Film Editing, Best Director. White supremacy is way profitable. Um, person, oh, a uh, person who called in from Maryland, your line is open. Other person that called in from Maryland, your line is open. I'll just listen. Okay. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. I agree with what you said earlier. We need more. Um, we, need, we need more white people on the program because um, we we need to put them out of. We need to put um, first of all the anti-racist out of business. But um, we we need more examples, you know, to um, to kind of show us that we can stand up to these white people and um, ask them questions and make them feel uncomfortable about them practicing racism openly. True. Um, you know what I took from when she said, I'm done, um, I give up, is kind of like not just on the program, like I said, <laughs> it kind of almost sounded like she was saying, you know, I may be giving up in general, but what I thought she really meant is, you know, I'm done trying to trick this nigga and, <laughs> and believing that <laughs> I'm well be. I took it the exact same way. Did anyone catch her using the word animal at the very end before she got off the phone? Yep. Yep. I did. Oh, I, I did. did. I heard it. I heard it. I, heard it. <laughs> I can't remember exactly what she what the what she said in regards to the the, the way she used it. Can, can anybody remind me? She was actually referring yep. to white people. She said when she said, um, "Oh, what would she say?" Oh, okay. God. When she was talking about that there, there were white people who were trying not to practice racism, she was like, but I bet you don't think that kind of animal exists. Wow. So, but, I mean, we don't think that kind of animal exists. We know it doesn't exist. So, I mean, she knows, too. I mean, what a phrase. What a phrase. <laughs> yeah, like, you should definitely, I think you should play clips. Like, you would probably be able to use some of those audio clips <laughs> in future shows. Like, Man. seriously. I would be playing it now if I could. If I could, if I could pause this, <laughs> I would be playing it back now just to uh, to break it down because that was incredible. Like, uh, we man, I didn't even, we didn't even recognize. We did, uh, we're 400 plus now. Our 400th brought, the Rocky program <laughs> was 400. <laughs> The Rocky program, the flute solo, that was 400, uh, and we didn't even recognize at the time, but 400-plus uh, programs, that was pretty, uh, quite a remarkable display of racism, white supremacy. I mean, wow. Cursing in a twin. Man. Mm-mm-mm. Well-meaning white person. What a display from a well-meaning white person. Yes. A victim using a, a racist white supremacist. <laughs> Whatever that means. Well, I'm right. The person. <laughs> right. I'm picking you just up used me. <laughs> I'm picking up background noise. Sounds like rumbling or something. Okay, I don't hear it now. Be used her. That has kind of a sexual connotation, I think. A white person saying that we used her. I would ring my cowbell, I think. I went back to listen to that. Mandingo. Mm-hmm. 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 And she gives that as a recommendation in the book. Like, white people, one of the things well-meaning racists should do is hang out with non-white people because that will help them. The way I read it, it will help them refine their ability to practice racism because the non-white people will point out things to them when they're being racist so they can refine the way that they speak and act so that their white supremacy is less detectable. That's the way I read it. 
And I agree with that. I spent a lot of time with racist woman working, and she said a lot of things that were blatantly racist. She would ask me questions and say things were racist. I think one of the things she asked about was jumping the broom. And she said, that just seems so racist to me. Isn't that racist? So instead of giving her an answer, I let her tell me why she thought it was racist or why she was saying it was racist. And um, I forget what explanation she had, Some, something having to do with slavery. Now, mind you, she's in a tragic arrangement as well, which I didn't realize this at first. But basically I, I, I made sure that I made it known jumping the broom was something that black people did because white people would not allow them to have legitimate marriages, and jumping over the broom was a way of signifying you were entering into a domestic life, even though you weren't going to be able likely to stay married and have a you know, a, a cohesive relationship. But I, I just noticed she would say blatantly racist things. I didn't say a word to her when she would do it. I just let her go on so I could observe it and see how she practiced racism without her alarm going up, oh, I need to change this, oh, I need to stop saying or doing that. I just, I just let it ride and watch. Just enjoyed the show and learned. I thought she was going to start crying. I was expecting that next. I wouldn't have been surprised. Same here. <laughs> I thought, uh, yeah, yeah, I thought uh, she was going to start crying too. Because, like, she kind of got upset and, like, at the end, and, you know, she was kind of being defensive. So, you know, it it it, it kind of seemed like she was going to kind of, like, uh, do the little um, fake crying thing that, you know, most white females do. Gus, when Jessica and said I, it, oh, I'm sorry, I can interrupt. And uh, and I bet uh, it would have been so embarrassing since, well, well, like, well, if she did cry, then I bet it would have been pretty embarrassing because, well, for her, because, um, like, uh, she's like an older white person. She's, yeah. Well, I bet, uh, I bet if I was uh, her, um, I bet I would have been pretty embarrassed if she, if, if I did cry. Justice, let me tell you one thing about older racist women. They do not get embarrassed when they cry. It's a tactic they use to make you feel sorry for them. So you stop calling them out on the carpet for practicing racism. I had to live with an older racist woman one time, and she would say very racist things to me. She would tell me, she would stare at me all the time and make me uncomfortable. And one morning I woke up and I hadn't combed my hair, and my hair is not relaxed, so it's standing up on my head. And she said, so why are you looking at me like that? She said, you know what you remind me of with your hair sticking up on your head like that? And I said, what? She said, a pickaninny. What's a pickaninny? What's the nerve to even say something like that? And because she was older than me, I didn't want to disrespect her and go off on her. So I was silent for about a half hour, and I was just fuming inside. I was really, really mad. And finally I told her about her behavior and how obnoxious it was and how even though she was old, I wasn't going to cut her any slack on doing that. And instantly she made this face like the like Granny from Bugs Bunny when she started looking all pitiful and playing dumb. Well, I, would, I don't know. I just said, I mean, well, you know, and she tried to play that helpless, pitiful old person who's suddenly now being picked on and they're the victim because they just told the truth. And I told her daughter about her behavior, and she was apologizing. She said, well, you know, it's the time she grew up in. And I'm like, those times are over. It's, it's 2000 and whatever it was. That's not an excuse. But it's a tactic that they will use so they don't feel embarrassed about crying justice. It's a, it's a, a, a scheme. It's a, a tactic that they use to make you feel sorry for them. But the times are not over. It's still ongoing. Right. Well, the time she grew up and you know, when, oh, they just talk blatantly, I guess, or openly about it. I think the woman must have been in her 80s or something. So she was saying she grew up in those times. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with anything. You know, that's not an excuse. How many more years have you lived since then? You know that's not appropriate. I wasn't as informed as I am now, but, you know, I mean, still, that's not an excuse. Mm-hmm. Thank you uh, for you're welcome. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, 
Uh, oh, man, I forgot what I was about to say. Uh, oh, well, go ahead, Gus. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, just uh, being codified with terms, uh, I think it would be, um, I think it would be more accurate, the term relaxer, if we replace that with chemically mutilate, um, just in terms of codifying our language. Um, I think that would be more accurate in terms of that process. Um, and also, I wanted to uh, echo uh, 818's thoughts on uh, white women crying, and uh, it is a strategic, tra uh, a strategic tactic of white supremacist woman. Uh, and that's one thing. I have heard, heard Farrell Winfrey. Uh, I think the first time that I heard her, um, she said, she said that is one of the worst things white people can do is to cry in front of non-white people in discussions on racism. Um, and I call that out like immediately. Uh, I've been in meetings where white people have done that and I immediately uh, tell them that is totally incorrect. Like you need to leave immediately if you think you're going to cry because we have been conditioned that whitey in us kicks in like double. <laughs> like seeing a white woman cry, it like becomes three times as large. Like, oh, my God, what did you do? Go give her a hug and a sweet potato. I mean, everything kicks in. Like, I mean, it's totally incorrect. And I mean, you need to see that as, as like the worst uh, of racism, white supremacy. And she even she has a passage in her book, uh, The Racist Who Was on the Program. Uh, this is on page 95. Now, dig, and this she says this is like the best of the well-meaning white people. This is like the best of the best. This is on page 95, and this is supposed to be a true report. Uh, she says uh, this is a white woman speaking. I was at a warehouse shopping area where people from certain non-white communities would come to do their shopping. And I had the radio on and heard about the acquittal. Uh, this is the case where the racists were acquitted uh, in the Rodney King trial, victim of white supremacy. Uh, this was right around 4 o'clock p.m., right when things were getting serious and I just fell apart. I was still parking my car and I started sobbing. And the car next to me had some black people in it, a black family who come to shop. I thought, I'm crying, and everybody is going to see that I'm a wreck. So as I was getting out of the car, several of the black people, there was eye contact. And I said, I just heard on the radio, and I don't know what to do. I just fell apart in front of them and was saying, I'm a teacher, and I just don't know what to do. What can we do? And they didn't know what to do with me. Laughing. She has that in uh, in brackets. So the, the, the racist white woman was laughing when she said that last sentence. The black people didn't know what to do with me. But they got sympathetic, I guess. And they said, keep teaching. Just keep teaching and thank you. They said, thank you. I still cry when I think about it. This illuminates the difference between one participant whose focus is inward and another whose focus is outward. One racist white woman's distress about her own relationship to racism, white supremacy, especially in the area of personal relations keeps her attention focused inwardly to a degree. The woman that I just read about has little distress in that area, and therefore her attention is focused in a more outward direction on what she can do to make a difference in terms of race issues. The racist woman that I just read about, her ability to think more clearly about race matters, that is her high Race awareness allows her to be actively anti-racist. So a white woman crying in front of some black people about the Rodney King verdict, that is a demonstration of a well-meaning, actively anti-racist white person. Did I miss the part where she did something about it? 
Yeah, no, man. I told you. She said, I'm a teacher, and I just don't know what to do. What can we do? And she cried. That's what she did. She cried. I just told you. Another racist uh, white female who is honest about that tactic and how they use it, uh, who was on the program, uh, is uh, Jessica Pettit. I was thinking of her. But didn't she attempt to play the? Didn't she? Didn't she attempt to play the victim when you tried to get her on the show the last time, Gus, and and try to say that you were picking on her or didn't like her because she was a lesbian or something like that? Oh yeah, she did the whole uh, the whole shenanigans. She cursed on the program, and um, yeah, I mean she she got upset, said we were victimizing her, said we were an embarrassment. Uh, it was very similar to her second visit on the pro which was justice's debut program no coincidence Yay. and uh like uh, i well now that uh well uh, um i uh when i first uh came on the program it was just competitive was it is that what you said mhm mm yeah um uh, Jessica, uh, well, uh, do you know if Jessica Petta is going to be coming on the program again? She told me to never contact her again. Man, that, <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> that's uh, pretty deep. That is really deep. Wow. Um, and that's from an anti-racist, doing anti-racist work. Yeah, admitted exactly. racist, admitted racist white supremacist. See, that's why I don't like that term. I mean, she it's crazy. Did she say that she was an anti-racist? I'll see. Either that or she said she was doing anti-racist work. Yeah, right. Okay, if, okay. if she really did that, then she wouldn't have, you know, uh, cursed on the program and, you know, um, was, uh, and, you know, uh, doing... Uh, incorrect things when I came on the program. If she was really an anti-racist or uh, she was doing anti-racist work, then, you know, she wouldn't have done all that uh, stuff that she did. She, on her website, I told you all, white people, they call them, white people are the law, the code, the system. On her website, in big letters, she says, I am social justice. Big letters. And then she has a rainbow in the background. She also alleges that she might be anti-sexual. I think she made reference to that as well. She's got a rainbow effect on her page. Uh, she says she is a diversity educator, that she is easy to work with, accessible, and brings very simple concepts that can be hard to put into action. From uh, like what does how is an admit race is going to be social justice? It's all about profit. When being a racist is non justice in and of itself. Yeah, it's definitely all about profit. Um another bit of information about that admitted racist uh Jessica Pettit. She, uh, at a conference that's supposed to be about racism, white supremacy, you know, race, uh, she had a, uh, it's, you know, it's called a white privilege conference, but, you know, no, no props to that place. But she had a, Jessica Pettis, she had like a, a maze kind of set up to, or I should say, you know, posters leading to this special bathroom that was supposed to be for transgender people. You know what I mean? Special bathroom. And it's uh, it was a regular old bathroom. You know, it was, it, it was just like a bathroom in anybody's house where a male or a female could use it. But, you know, she made special attention to this, you know, transgender, uh, LGBTQI, XYZ uh, bathroom, you know. Was the term gender neutral bathrooms? Right, right. That's what it was. Yeah. Gender neutral bathrooms. What's that? 
Man, <laughs> that's racism, white supremacy, and contempt for gender. That's what Mr. Fuller calls it, racism, white supremacy, and contempt for gender. At the, uh, you said at the top of her uh, page, at the top of, um, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, okay, um, uh, you said at the top of uh, her website, um, you said that it, it said social something, or? I am social, social justice. justice. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, whatever social justice means, um, you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I have no clue what social justice means, so, you know, races in their terms, races in their terms. The uh, if you look at the title for her web page, it says I am social justice training and transgender education. Completion. Bringing in that gay thing with uh, white supremacy. Pam, your line is open, just to let you know. I'm hearing glasses in the background. If you could uh, use mute to make sure we don't have a lot of extra background noise, I would appreciate it. There are a lot of people on the line, so it would be helpful. Pam, your line is open, and uh, if you want to dial in on the free HD line, I can uh, pick you up over there as well. Oh, the uh, I just wanted to make sure folks know, um, apparently there is someone in the chat room going by the handle, I hate niggers. And he said he would love to come on the program. Uh, he left his email, so uh, oh, really? I will contact him and see. He might be one of the folks from Chimp Out. Uh, so I will contact him and see uh, if he wants to come hang out. I wonder. Oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody say, did somebody say something? Well, good evening. Hello. Um. Um, uh, um, yeah, uh, I, well, uh, I suspect, uh, that a person is a white person, but, but I'm not being correct. Well, they talk about all the non-white people they have over one chimp out, um, that hate niggers as well, but, you know, anti-blackness is white supremacy. I mean, I mean, in, in, in my view, there are a lot of black people that hate niggers as well, so. I don't see the significance of them um, coming on and leaving reviews about, you know, it's not only white people hate you, blah, blah, blah. Speaking of... I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, speaking of uh, anti-blackness, um, <laughs> uh, Gus, do you, do you remember the game Fluidity? Certainly. <laughs> Yes, I have lots of anti-blackness in there. Uh, rainbows, um, uh, blackness, trying to heal the blackness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the object of the game. Remove, remove all of the blackness. I think that's the that's the whole objective of the game. That's the purpose of playing. Remove mm-hmm. removal of blackness. Mm-hmm. And helping white people. That's an integral aspect Get of it as well. Get rid of all niggers. Yep, that and helping white people. That is an integral aspect of the game, helping white people accomplish tasks and practice racism, white supremacy. Like you, I don't think you can end the game without aiding white people repeatedly. Like a part of the game, um, I, I was playing it, and uh, um, there's uh, the, like, um, like, like you know, um, I was playing with the water. And um, I had to uh, like because uh, like there was the, there's these crabs and uh, like uh, to get to the crabs well of course well okay the, uh, you're gonna have to kill the blackness to get the crabs and then to help the white person yeah, um, that is part of uh, what of well that is part of what I had to do. Um, in that uh, section uh, of the game, um, the way you uh, so like 
I had to get the crabs, and then without getting hit, I had to uh, kill the blackness by touching it, and then, and then, and then, and then it, um, then all of a sudden it just disappears, and then it gives you more water, and you know, <sighs> yeah. And they are so anti-black, so anti-black. And then, uh, and then the, um, and then after when you get all of the crabs. Then uh, the the white person um, gives you a rainbow drop. You know what else would be interesting? Um, when that racist uh, from Chip Out comes on, if he could, I guess, point you in the direction of the, a non-white person who's a member of that site, who could come on the site, I mean, they would come on the program. I think that would be instructive as well. I'm um, just seeing if that non-white person can listen to logic, follow, and, you know, just kind of see what's going on. Um, non-white people who had chip out, and, you know, if it's as many as, you know, these racists claim there to be. All I heard, I was just waiting. <laughs> Thought other people had comments. Uh, yes, sir. Got it. being heard? Yes. <laughs> yes, you can be heard. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I said uh, I heard these requests about the folks that chimp out. Um, got it. Um, I was just muting. If anyone else had anything they wanted to uh, share, they can feel free. Or I do have that okay. other report. I'm saving time for that as well. Wonder if it's going to be hard to get any more anti white anti racists on your show, Gus. You're probably spreading the word. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of white people. <laughs> I mean, they, for their ten percent of the global population, that's a lot of white people. Um, you know, I called a uh, racist in New Zealand um, yesterday evening, and he was talking about how racism is. Uh, a bad problem over there. Non-white people can't get the help they need because of racism still. Uh, and I'm going to see if we can get him on the program. So I'm not, I'm not really concerned. <laughs> There's a lot of white people on the planet. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not concerned at this point about running out of uh, racists to speak with and uh, get to come on the program. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure um, what the handle was for the young lady that um, was telling the story about the old white woman, but I hope that she is on the program on the 17th of this month about dealing with racist women at the workplace because I need all the constructive help that I can get. <laughs> That's me, 818. I'll do my best. Oh, thank you. I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking I hope you participate. Yeah. While I was experiencing, I was thinking, man, I wonder how they've done that program yet. I have a lot of info to share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, most black women could come up with some stories 
And that's the sad thing about it is white women have been largely overlooked and uh, excused and, and pretty much uh, not seen as a problem. And uh, a lot of times because black men and women interact differently with white females, a lot of times black men don't see what we see. And we see a lot. Right, I noticed this particular uh, racist woman was extremely flirtatious with black males. And they have a tendency, too, to be very manipulative and create a lot of dissension. I mean, they, would, they will try to turn black men against black women. They can't, you know, say things and, uh, you know, because I've had men come and tell me some of the things that white women have said to them about black women. They're bad news. I actually, at my old job, uh, had a uh, racist coworker um, who was married to a black male. Um, uh, used to like, like, try to like convince me that you know, <laughs> black women weren't the way to go. Um, I think she said, uh, "You start getting with white women." Um, like, wow. Crazy, and she's married, so I'm not even seeing the vested interest that you know she even has in this in this whole thing. So. Well, she was doing it, or he was doing it. Oh no, it was a racist female. Okay, you know it's not just the white females; it's also happens with non non black non white females. They'll do the same thing. Uh, for some strange reason, black women seem to be the target, almost a universal target of non white people and uh, white people for some odd reason. And I suspect, like in most things, that there must be something extraordinary about us because nobody keeps attacking junk. Junk stands on its own as junk. You don't have to tell anybody that junk is junk. They can see it for themselves. So all these attacks and all this, all this madness and insecurity toward black women speaks volumes as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I found that same kind of behavior among Asian women, among Hispanic women, they all seem to have this issue with black women. And I'm not talking about black women who have bad attitudes and all this other stereotypical stuff. I'm talking about black women who have been pleasant to them. And it just seems. Do you like think that has to do with that fear of genetic annihilation or the fear of the, the dominant genes as well? You know, I don't know when it comes to the non white females, but I suspect that black women are unique. And that black women, even while they put us down, they say that we're the most confident women on the planet. So I think we intimidate non-white women, uh, some, not all. And I think uh, particularly, you know, women who are smaller, uh, I just think that we seem, you know, maybe our skin color and, and our personalities and uh, just just overall, I think we can be, appear to be larger than life, appear to be confident, appear to be strong you know, whatever that is. And I think that I've seen that, you know, at my job. And, uh, you know, you haven't done anything to them. You're being friendly. But they, they're, they're, they're underhanded. For a black woman, they'll smile and flirt with black men and tell black men, you ought to get the Asian woman. <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, all I can tell you is hey, you can get an Asian woman, a Hispanic woman, or a white woman, but you show me where that builds you a power base or economic base or a business base and how that keeps you employed and keeps you safe from police bullets, and I'll say go ahead and do it. But from what I can see, every other ethnic group has security because they have unity. They have business basis because they have unity. They have economic basis because they have unity. So if somebody can show me an interracial power base, you know. Yeah, I haven't seen one yet. No, I don't think you will. And it's interesting, too, how these non non-black, non-white or white females are so into black men, but they never show up when you're needed. They've never been on the line. They never got bitten by dogs or, or holes with fire hoses or went down to Gina, Louisiana to champion the rights for six black boys that nobody knew. And they're, they're nowhere to be found. Their organizations aren't anywhere to be found when black men are in trouble. So I would strongly advise people, you know, you, you really got to think about... Uh, what are other ethnic groups doing to, to try to get some security and some economic prosperity? And then ask if what we're doing is working. Can 
Can I be heard? Yes, sir. I work retail, and I always notice that whenever I'm checking out or I'm helping a non-white female, my um, my uh, my white cashiers they'll give me that look like, "What are you doing helping helping her and smiling at her and complimenting her? What are you doing?" They they give me that look, and it's, it's just like what um, what and all the other callers are saying in regards to uh, racist women and, and her antics. And, you know, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was going to co-sign. I, I work in retail part-time, and I had a time where uh, two females, one racist, one non-white, and um, uh, the racist female was actually kind of mine for my attention. Most of my time talking to non white people. Oh, yeah, they definitely. Um, if you even look at the television shows, uh, if there's a show that has, uh, you know, supposed to be quote unquote a black show uh, with black females on it, they always put a white woman in the midst. She's, they got to have a white friend. But when you look at white women's shows, they never have a black friend. So it's like they're trying to tell black women, uh, and not just on television but in real life, that you have no boundaries that I'm bound to respect. You have nothing that belongs to you, but you better not come where I am. Uh, and white men are guilty of it too. I've had white men, t- you know, not not in a long time, but I used to have white men tell me things about black men. So, you know, they're constantly just trying to make sure that we stay divided because they, they need us to stay divided. So it's not just a white female that's... Uh, Manipulating, you know, they're whispering in the black woman's ear too. And and one thing I want to add too is, it's not just the straight white women; it's the lesbian white women. I had a a, a, a black female tell you this story that uh, uh, she had a lot of issues. I don't know with men or whatever. Anyway, she this big white female, Amazon white. This is how she described it, Amazon white female defended her. And one day her daughter was coming uh, in a parking lot or something like that, and some black guys were messing with her. So this Amazon white female jumps out of nowhere and saves the day and, 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 and I guess, gets these black men to whatever, you know, almost like she tried to tell the woman that she beat these black men up. And then uh, I believe that white female was trying to get into a sexual relationship with that black female because when I asked the black female some questions, she got angry and uh, dropped me as a friend. And I said, yeah, that white female is after her sexually. And she may have already had her. And she, this white female would tell this black female all kinds of stuff about black men, how black men were no good. And so she could get into this black female's bed. I and mean, it's really creepy, but, you know, not just the heterosexual ones. I had a passage. Uh, this is in the racist uh, who was on the program today. Uh, I wanted to see what you all thought about this sentence. Uh, I think it's related to the conversation. This is on page 22, uh, and she says, the segment of whites least likely to exhibit white supremacy is progressive white women who have or have had relationships with people of color. What do you all think about yeah. that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Gus? Yes, ma'am. Not true. <laughs> the, uh, the sentence again, uh, this is page 22, uh, chapter 2 of uh, quote-unquote silent Racism. I think the title it would be more accurate if it was uh, refined white supremacy. The segment of whites least likely to exhibit white supremacy is progressive white women who have or have had relationships with people of color. There it is. Hmm. 
Wow. Impressive. Tragic relationships. I guess that kind of reminds me. Um, I um, I was looking on Facebook the other day, and uh, I saw uh, a white girl um, suspected, oh, sorry, racist. Um, she posted on her, uh, I guess she posted on her wall or whatever, came up in my news feed, and was like, um, I like my men chocolate on the outside, and creamy and inside. And I'm just like, what does that mean? I'm like, does that mean that you want a white identified black male or that you want to turn this black male into somebody white identified or, you know, like completely separate them from, you know, being black or being a victim or feeling that they're being mistreated? Like, I didn't know how to read that. <laughs> Maybe I, she was just being nasty. Well, um, that could be too. That could be too, but I think I was looking for. It seemed like it was a at a uh, at least had like a double meaning to it. I'll make sure I tell folks uh, I set eyes on the prize. That Africans in America is a really great documentary series. Uh, I would highly recommend that. Um, white, I mean, white people have extraordinary information uh, on racism, white supremacy. It has a lot of um, archival footage. Uh, just, you know, them white people being truthful about racism, white supremacy. Um, they were talking about the... Uh, so-called Revolutionary War and a lot of victims, uh, so-called slaves, uh, they were fleeing from the white people, uh, so-called Americans. They were fleeing from the plantations and then they were trying to go and be safe with the British white people. And on the documentary, they got, you know, lots of non-white people, black people saying that, you know, this is, uh, they don't say that you know, this is racism, but that's what it is uh, in history when they say, oh, that the black people left the plantations and went and they got safe with uh, the racists who were so-called British. Um, she said they were just lots of the people that they had on the documentary. They were saying that's just not true. These people were racist, too. They were trading in slaves, too. And uh, I mean, it's just really ugly when they talk about when the racist British white people lost and they were leaving and the measures that the racist white people uh, in the area of the world known as America that they went to to make sure that black people didn't escape with the racist British white people when they were leaving after the war like they had guards stationed out on the beach uh, to make sure that they didn't sneak away on any ships I mean really ugly racism white supremacy it had it had, I mean man you talk about feeling bad double whammy it had one part when it talked about the british racist uh, so-called british they were running out of food they were about to lose and the black people a lot of them they got stuck because of course they were not white so the racist british they were like you know <laughs> you niggers our supplies are low you know hit the road and so they got stuck uh, it talks about how they were, a lot of them, they were starving, they were hiding out in the woods, the racist whites who were protecting them were leaving, they lost, and they were left with the racist whites that they were running away from to begin with, and how it was just, I mean, really ugly situation, I mean, which is every day under white supremacy, but tons of details, I mean, really informative, I would highly encourage folks to check it out, I think it's like a six-hour series, 
Africans in America, a PBS documentary. Uh, I think you can you can watch it online. You can download it. You should be able to get it at your your local uh, library. P- the white people at PBS, they have a lot of uh, great material on white supremacy. Lots of it. Wow. Uh, the phone line kind of, oh, there are other people. Uh, the caller from D.C., if you're trying to, all of the other people that have called on, if you want to talk, I think we have codified that the queue is star eight. That's how you can queue. So all the people that called in, if you're interested in uh, getting a question or comment in, I think it's star eight, and I can open your line up, star eight, uh, for the people that talk to you. D.C., your line is open. Hi. Um, I also just wanted to add for um, Robin and Roland's mom, if she's still on the line, um, she chooses to uh, allow the children to watch um, um, the PBS shows um, Africans in America to not just watch it, to take notes as well. Um, I've known some people, I don't have any children, but I've known some people who have children and they um, said that they expect an essay um, at the end of the week of what they've watched. So, and then, then their brain computers are basically um, turning to ask questions um, during the week to themselves and possibly to the parents. By the time the end of the week, they have an essay that basically says, okay, this is what I've found and this is what um, I've gathered in those type of specials in order to um, have a, a, a document to basically remind them of you know, what they've learned, basically. That's all. Uh, Mind Depth, uh, your line is open as well. Thank you. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is good. I'm actually... uh, I caught the the tail end of the show. Um, I have to go back into the archives and and listen to the beginning because what you guys have been talking about sounds pretty interesting. So I'll make sure I do that in the next hour uh, after after it gets shut down or tomorrow. But, um, Gus, you were talking about um, the the shows that uh, PBS has on blacks in America. There actually was one recently, um, and you can actually go on – kpbs.com and watch the archive. Anybody can go on. Um, and it's called uh, Blacks in Latin America. And it's also um, kind of to the same regard as Blacks in America. Um, shows a lot of our um, the <laughs> what you would call the history of white supremacy um, from the from the beginning of slavery um, and where all, all of the areas in, in Latin America that um, we touched and um, there was this. There's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, a lot of interesting stuff. One of it, they did a. I think it was in Peru. Um, one of the episodes, they were showing um, how before uh, when when the slaves first got to Peru. I think it was Peru. Uh, it may have been another country, but when the slaves first got there, um, there was a revolt, and um, one of the. The, the major people who, who started the revolt was a general, um, a slave, and then he grew. Uh, uh, um, it basically ended the slavery in that country, and over time, the white the 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 uh, the whites the racists in uh, in that country um, in history books started to change the image of the man because he had so much stronghold within the country. So they eventually started to change him to become more and more white in the history books. <laughs> so it's, it's it's very interesting. There's a lot of stuff in uh in that uh in that documentary that they had. So anybody who wants to take a look at that, that's very good uh very good indication of uh, white supremacy from its very beginnings. That's all I had to say. Thank you. 
Jacqueline. Oh, this is Lucy again. I also wanted to um, give an example of Trepanier's um, view, the last comment you said, Gus, about how the progressive white you know, that they're the least likely to be racist. Well, I beg to differ because um, Bar Barbara Walters basically had an affair with a black senator um, in the 70s mm -hmm. on the hush. And uh, I had read on the Huffington Report that basically she needed to stop doing this because it would ruin her career, not so much his career. Mm. So I found that very interesting. But um, I'm I'm really surprised that she decided to come out with with a black senator who who was married, by the way. Um, after all those years, it's almost like she said it to give credibility, you know, a street cred or something like that. That I did it with a black man, and I'm, you know, I'm Barbara Walters, so pretty much. So I guess she's one of those progressive white women who's made it um, in the ed um, in the midst of male dominance, male patriarchy, and she made it, and she's successful, progressive, and she's a role model to white women. But then again, she had an affair with a married black, so. I guess Dr. Trefanye probably find, found that very progressive and non-racist, but I beg to differ. It seems like there's something going on where it's almost like it gives you, like you said, street cred to sleep with a black man. It doesn't mean you're not practicing racism. It just means that, you know, uh, it's almost like it, it's some kind of fad, you know. And then, too, if he was married and she's coming forth with it, not caring how she affects the family or the wife, if the white is still living. So they have no respect for black uh, people, no respect for black families, no respect for black marriages, no respect for black females, and no respect for black men. They just consider it uh, totally unimportant to what they want to do. I think Mr. Fuller says that is maximum racist aggression. I mean, maybe that is, you know, a part of why people look up to her. That is a maximum act of racism, white supremacy, sexual intercourse with a bland, I mean, gosh, then he's married? I mean, that is the worst of the worst. Again, that's Thomas Jefferson. Did anybody ever criticize her? Anybody criticize her for sleeping with a married man? I don't remember that happening. Neither do I. And, I mean, she's on a show with other women, and Whoopi Goldberg's on, you know, her show that she produces with you. I don't really think that she got any type of backlash for that act at all, not even from Oprah Winfrey. I think I'm yeah. <laughs> I think she went on Oprah's show to talk about it, too, and I don't think there was a backlash either. Yeah, that's just something that I observed, and that's a good question. I Yeah, I wanted to see if there were backlash, and there was no backlash. And this woman basically talks to people who have affairs, she mm -hmm. wants people to call out, you know, why did you have an affair? Why did you have an affair? Mm -hmm. But she can't even talk about her, you know, indiscretion. Well, you know, the black the black wife didn't count. She was, uh, non, she was a non-essential factor. So it wasn't really like committing adultery because you had to do that with people. Mm -hmm. so you, don't, you, don't do with, you don't do that with people who are not real, you know. Yeah, that goes back to uh, Beryl Winfrey's non-person mm -hmm. comment. Mm -hmm. it, I wonder if this was the person that she, I don't know if it was Barbara Walters, it was some uh, very well-to-do white female, uh, wealthy, who had some kind of short affair with Bobby Short in the same building where he couldn't, she lived in a building that he couldn't move into. No black people lived in her building. But she had some brief affair with Bobby Short, the musician long time ago. I can't think of what her name was. And I remember thinking, wow, she lives in a building that won't let black people in, but she'll open that, she'll, she'll raise that skirt, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he can't live in her building. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Prince wow. of Monaco, Albert of uh, Prince of Monaco, he has a non-white child with a non-white woman. Of course, he wasn't allowed to marry her. He's now married to a blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman. Um, black and I saw that. Yeah, he doesn't look happy in any of those pictures with that with the white 
um, suspected racist woman, but they kept the the child, the non-white child, um, you know, hidden for as long as possible. Oh, part of that white man's code. Yeah. You know, they uh, they know how to make the they they know the difference for the most part between having a little fun and passing your legacy and wealth and uh, whatever status you have to a non-white person. For the most part, they don't do it. They're always at war. <laughs> Naked, gun in hand, smile, well-meaning, <laughs> sweet potato pie. White people are always at war. Believe that. <laughs> in fact, if they have their clothes off, man, they are at war hard with you. If That, that maximum maximum racist aggression. Um, Biko, Biko's A1, uh, your line is open. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Hello. I've, I've been enjoying the show. What I would like to do is find a way to donate to the program, and I've been online looking, and and. Um, since um, the show is not with um, blog talk, I don't see a donate button or a PayPal button. Uh, in the dis- in the description for the program, it should say uh, "Invest in the Cows," and there should be a link. Uh, it'll take you uh, to the PayPal, um, my PayPal button. Uh, yeah, it's in the description for the program. If you're if you're on the talk to you page, if you click the little the yes, little I, I'm, on, I'm on the page and I see category education and then I host it by, and uh, I don't see a link to, uh, unless I'm overlooking it. Uh, I can give you the the link for the page. Uh, it would be if you put in tiny t i n y tiny dot let me get on let me get it on a text pad real quick. I'll just type it here. Okay, okay. Okay. Dot C C forward slash R W S W J. That will take you to the Cows program page at TalkShoe. Okay. Tiny T I N Y dot C C forward slash R W S W J. Is that correct? There. Did I? Yes, sir. That is correct. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. That'll take you to the program page, and if you just hit the little information button for any of the programs to get the description, it should be uh, it should be right there in the description. It'll say "Invest in the Cows," and it'll have the link where you can click and do so. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <sighs> The gentleman, i uh, make sure I get in as well. The gentleman uh, who suggested Eric Green, uh, he wrote uh, Planet of the Apes uh, as American Mythology. Um, I spoke with him, uh, and he actually suggested doing two programs. Uh, where We do one uh, where we talk about his book and all of the, the films and, you know, Planet of the Apes that has been produced so far, and then a follow-up program when the movie comes out later this summer. So, uh yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, also, um, I didn't even think about this before, but uh, I definitely think it's relevant now. The most recent Planet of the Apes uh, with Mark Wahlberg uh, and Michael uh, Clark Duncan, also from Green Mile. The most recent Planet of the Apes came out, was released in theaters about a month and a half before 9-11. I wouldn't have really thought anything about that before, but when I thought of that today, I definitely think that that is relevant. Yeah, I'll 
So Gideon, I have one more article. I remember the other day when I was sharing the terms on the program. I was reading the uh, derogatory terms. A person emailed me that list, and I gave out the address online. I said, you should go and check it um, because, you know, it might be more than I suspect. When I actually checked the link that I gave that had all the racist terms on it, um, I don't even remember all of them. B-U-N, Big Ugly Nigger, it was a whole list of them. Um, the page is loaded. I mean, I, don't, I can't even imagine how many of these terms they have on the page here. Um, I think I had maybe, I think what I read the other day is about maybe 10%, not even 10% of all the terms uh, that they have on here. I mean, they have uh, nigglu uh, for a nigger in uh, Alaska or some place that's very cold, nigglu. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's just astounding uh, how many terms that they have codified uh, to articulate racism, white supremacy. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's just astounding. Um, it's, uh, I'm looking at the list now, <laughs> trying to pick out some of the, uh, <sighs> some of the worst terms uh, on here, some of the more interesting ones. Um, let's see. Ice nigger, that's another one that's for, uh, that's for niggers who actually reside in Canada. So here, white people have coded that nigger Canadian, that's their code. In Canada, racists have coded that ice nigger. That's what we mean for black people who actually reside uh, in Canada. Uh, let's see. Oh, my Lord. Ice nigger. Uh, it says on here, it's cold in Canada, coined by comedian Scott Thompson from the Kids in the Hall. That's what it says on this website here. Um, Wow. Apparently, some racists have actually codified JJ to mean blacks uh, in general, just a goofy black person. That's just code, I guess, for nigger. JJ, another JJ. Let's see. Looking at the, I'll give you all the website because, like I said, it's more than I could. It's more than I could ever read. Um, more than I could ever read. Uh, the website again is uh, gyral.blackshell.com forward slash names dot html. I'll give it again. Gyral, g y r a l. dot blackshell. dot com forward slash Names. Html. Um, it's. I mean, it's tons of. Them. I would. I think it's definitely worth uh, a look. <laughs> um, to see just tons of terms, tons of them might help you out. You might hear a white person using, you know, these terms uh, around you, and uh, you know, <laughs> might help you uh, figure. Oh my! I remember some of the terms I was reading. Cocoa puff. Has anyone heard that? Cocoa puff. Yes, could you give that one more time? I'm sorry. Cocoa Puff. Cocoa Puff, I like mean, the cereal. The, the address. Oh, yeah. Gyral, G-Y-R-A-L, uh -huh. dot blackshell, dot com, forward slash, names, dot H-T-M-L. Nice. <laughs> okay. So the term Cocoa Puff. Has anyone heard that? Cocoa Puff? Sure. Real interesting one here. I mean, that's why when, when the statement, I think, uh, D, he was saying earlier about uh, the white woman, the racist female who said that uh, she wanted her male to be uh, dark and cre dark uh, on the outside, dark and chocolatey on the outside and creamy inside, or however she phrased it. Um, I pay attention to metaphors like that because a uh, term like this, Cocoa Puff, what it says here, Cocoa Puff can be either for a black person or a white person. It represents a slang term for blacks or a derogatory term for a white woman who sleeps or has children with black people originated from the cereal of the same name that turns white milk into chocolate milk.
I call that dedication. <laughs> I mean, look at all the time they dedicate, and yet white people will tell you that white people aren't dedicated. Time and energy. Open up sites, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> this will be the last one I'll share. Um, <laughs> I'll check if anyone else. Um, they also have on here uh, Cornelius, derogatory term from black people, Planet of the Apes reference. Cornelius, he was one of the apes uh, in the original uh, Planet of the Apes, Cornelius. I'll make sure I get the other report. And if anyone uh, is watching, I said I, we will remain on the air until the uh, finals game ends, uh, unfortunately. And I'm hoping it ends soon. But the game ends. Uh, if anyone is watching, they could let me know. I would appreciate it. Um, this post is on RacismDaily.com. I wanted to share this because I said Dr. Welsing, she told me about this uh, this movie um, in 2009, she was telling me, she said uh, it was on, and she was watching it the night before, uh, she, doing her homework, studying white supremacy. And uh, I just, I posted it on Facebook at, like, I think 3 in the morning when I found it. Uh, but the title of the post is, uh, Dam Busters Remake Will Change Dog's Name to Digger. Critics Want Nigger Name to Remain. So this old World War II film, there was a black dog named Nigger, and they're remaking this film, and they're going to change the dog's name to Digger. And apparently some white people are upset about this. Uh, the Dam Buster's dog Nigger will be renamed Digger for a modern remake of the iconic film to avoid offending viewers it has emerged. Scriptwriter Stephen Fry, 53, has confirmed that pilot Guy Gibson's faithful black Labrador, man oh man, uh, has confirmed that pilot Guy Gibson's faithful black Labrador will be renamed for the forthcoming Peter Jackson movie. In the original 1955 film, Gibson's dog, Gibson's dog's name was spoken 12 times as a code word to represent successful dam breaches to RAF Bomber Command. Now that right there is interesting. I think Josh Wickett had uh, made a post about this before, but I'll read that again because I think this is this is true. I think this happened uh, truthfully. That's why they put it in the film that during World War II they did use that term nigger as a code name. Uh, but I'll read it again. Gibson's dog's name was spoken 12 times as a code word to report successful dam breaches to RAF Bomber Command. But Fry, who is writing the script for the long-awaited remake, has revealed he will now be renamed Digger to avoid American to avoid offending American viewers. He said there is no question in America that you could ever have a dog called Nigger. Although they have had <laughs> that repeatedly. It's no good saying that it is the Latin word for black or that it didn't have the meaning that it does now. You just can't go back, which is unfortunate. Hmm. You can go to RAF Scrampton and see the dog's grave, and there he is with his name, and it's an important part of the film. The name of the dog was a code word to show that the dam had been successfully breached. In the film, you're constantly hearing inward, inward, excuse me, sorry about that. In the film, you're constantly hearing nigger, 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 hooray, <laughs> and Barnes is just punching the air. White people have way too much fun practicing racism, white supremacy, way too much fun. Uh, in the film, you're constantly hearing the word nigger, 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 hooray, and Barnes Wayless is punching the air. But obviously, that's not going to happen now. So digger seems okay, I reckon. The iconic 1955 film tells the story of British World War II scientists who developed a bouncing bomb as a means of attacking Germany's dams. During the film, a special squadron of Lancaster bombers, 617 Squadron, is formed and trained by Wing Commander Guy Gibson. 
His black Labrador dog, Nigger, is present throughout the film and his name repeatedly used as a code word to report successful breaches of dams. But when Peter Jackson began planning a remake of the historic film, which has been scripted by Fry, the team agreed to rename him Digger. Nigger died in a car accident on the morning of the Dam Busters raid on the 16th of May, 1943, and is buried at the squadron's home of RAF Scampton Lynx. The move has attracted criticism from historians and aviation enthusiasts who have revealed they are unhappy with the alteration. Mervyn Hallam, curator of RAF Scrampton Museum, today slammed the change and accused Fry of trying to rewrite history. He said it's not a problem with colored people. It's the people in power creating the problem. Sod their political correctness and sod human rights. Hmm. They should keep the dog's name the same. It's ridiculous that they are trying to rewrite history. His grave is still here with his name on it. What they are trying to do is dis. <laughs> oh man, what they are trying to do is dishonoring nigger and dishonoring the brave men who flew that mission. I mean, it's hard to read this and take this seriously. Like, you have white people who are mad about this dog being renamed from nigger to digger. I mean, and he is really upset about this. At any rate, let, and again, Dr. Chen Weezu, white people treat their dogs better than they treat black people. We have over 9,000 visitors a year at the RAF Scrampton, and many of them are not native to England, but none of them are offended. Nigger is the name of the dog, and that shouldn't be interfered with. In the context of the time and the film, it's not a racist name. I just want to say that one more time. So in 1955, Nigger is the name of the dog, and that should not be interfered with. In the context of 1955, that time period, the film is not racist. Hmm. Jim Shortland, a historian who specializes in the dam busters, added, I'm unhappy with the change because it's sacrificing historical accuracy for political correctness, in particular for the American market. If someone was offended by Guy Gibson's name, you wouldn't go around calling him Richard Todd. One wonders what else the film might get wrong. Once you know something is incorrect, you're going to be suspicious. But Phil Bonner, spokesman for Aviation Heritage Lincolnshire, admitted the name of the dog is very emotive, in quotes. He said, the name of the dog is very emotive for many people, and in some respects, it's a reflection of the changes that have happened across the generations. The whole core of the film is about the bravery of the people who flew from Lincolnshire on a very daring raid, and it's important that this aspect of the film is not watered down. And I just want to go back to the part where they uh, admit that a big part of this film was hearing nigger, 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 hooray, and a white man, <laughs> racist, punching in the air. That this is constantly happening in the film, Dam Busters. Again, this is on RacismDaily.com. This came out, uh, this was published on June 10th, 2011. The movie, Dam Busters. Dam Busters, that's the name of the film in 1955. And uh, the title of the report, Dam Busters Remake will change dog's name to Digger. Critics want Nigger name to remain. Context of white supremacy. Oh, the cherry on top of that story, when Dr. Welsing told me about this some years ago, she said that at the time, her college professor, uh, she was in grad school, she said the president of her college, a white man, racist, he too had a black dog. His dog was also named Nigger. And I think she talked about this in the archives. Um, I guess Mind Depth and Walking Bear, your lines are open. Listeners? 
Greetings. I was uh, Googling up uh, Dan Busters 1955, and they do have some scenes on YouTube. I don't know if they have the, uh, you know, using the nigger word or not in the scenes, but it, it is on YouTube, bits and pieces of it. I didn't find a uh, full version of the film, but I didn't look very long. Hey, uh, Gus, I just wanted to let you know that the, the game has uh, ended. Hey, man. <laughs> Hey, we've been on the air almost four hours. My gosh. Um, yeah, it's been I, over for a while. Oh, okay. Praise. Thank you. Thank you, White Jesus. Um, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's actually archival footage of you can find on YouTube. I'm trying to find it. Josh, we can to me. Uh, you can find, like, I mean, this is like documentary film of white people explaining that this really happened. Like, this is not just movie stuff, that they really did use the term nigger as their code for success in the war. That's what I was trying to find. This is not, you know, this is not fiction any way around. <laughs> like, yes, white people did have dogs named nigger. Yes. And they really did do this. This was their code word for success, successful violence against an enemy nigger. Uh, that's what I was trying to find. I'm, I'm going to see if I can dig it out of my email. Uh, I believe Josh Wickett sent it to me. Uh, we'll be ending uh, in like five minutes. So if there's anything you want to get out, uh, get it in quick. Yeah, uh, just uh, very quickly, it's kind of funny that uh, this thing about the dog being named uh, nigger. I had uh, growing up in Boston um, when I was younger, I had to be like, I had to be like 10 and, um, Maybe no. I could have been in my teens actually. And um this this female that I was um that I was trying to pursue, this mixed female, um, she had, she was black and white, um and uh her brother was also mixed <laughs> and her brother had a pit bull and the their pit bull's name in the household was nigga. Interesting. Oh, did their mother and father live together? No. Nope. The uh the mother it was the mother and she was white and um mm -hmm. she was um she was pretty much what you would, would, would call white trash. I know a similar tale uh where a friend of mine he has a I don't know if it's a, a male a rel male relative, a black male relative and this black male's relative is married to a white female, and the kids and the woman call him nigger. <laughs> and he lives wow. in Oklahoma, and you can yeah, Oklahoma is very repressive for mm. black people. And you know, you would think somebody would make that up, but he wasn't making it up. He said so. The Recorded live. You are unmuted. We could all benefit from. Mm. That was just a thought that, you know, instead of having people, you know, fear that somebody's going to recognize their voice or their handle. Exactly. Just a thought. That's a good idea. Uh, Gus? Yes, sir. Um... I'm not sure this is considered codified, but um, a white guy I know who um, uses the gun range as well, he was at a local gun range, and he said that uh, three black males were in there. And I was asking questions, were, were they young, old? No, they were in their late 20s. 
with their pants hanging down. No, no, they were just dressed normal, which means I guess their pants weren't hanging down. And he said the uh, one of the employees at the gun range or gun store said uh, just kind of tapped on the shoulder, told him to just kind of observe or watch. And he sat back and watched. And, you know, they asked some questions and all that. And then eventually he left uh, empty-handed, nothing, they didn't purchase anything. And then one of the three employees at the gun store said, you know, did the, uh, the, the, the chop at the neck or the no, no, no at the neck? And said, we don't do shadows. Now, I don't know if shadows is a considered a codified word. That sounds pretty overt. But because they were in the midst of another white person, they felt comfortable saying that. And that's a white person that I know um, who shared something that, you know, what we don't see when we're not around. And uh, he, he's, he claims that he doesn't patronize that facility anymore. But um, he, he saw three black males, and he said they didn't look. Um, he never used, I, I was using terms like thuggish or anything like that. No, they look. He used the term normal, which is, I guess, opposite of what stereotypical thugs are supposed to look like or black males are supposed to look like. But um, they were asking questions about different weapons. They were, you know, asking about prices, and you know, they left empty-handed. And after they left, the term uh, "we don't do shadows." Now, I've been to that gun store, and I've had people that are kind of yes/no answers only. And usually in gun stores or gun people, white, black, whatever, they they will tell you every nook and cranny about a weapon. And so I've I've experienced both in there. But it, this is someone telling me what what happens when we're not around. So again, I don't know if um, shadow would be considered codified, but it's definitely one of those words that uh, they obviously are still using. And this is this story is about three months old. I definitely don't want us to have guns or know how to use them. <laughs> Absolutely not. <clears throat> Excuse me. Absolutely not. Um, that is four hours. Uh, we are calling it uh, a broadcast. Uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow. Um, I think we're going to do um, see if we can do some codification tomorrow. Uh, people wanted because I know the listener who said she had a uh, a role play that she wanted to do, and she wanted people to give suggestions on errors they've made talking with white people and how they can improve. Um, she was she was looking forward to a chance to do that, so we should have an opportunity uh, tomorrow evening. Um, the program will be 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, yeah, tomorrow evening that would be Monday, June 13th. Um, Tuesday, C.C. Blackman, uh, author of Towards the Destruction of a Nigger Mentality, uh, he'll be here. Uh, he seems a lot less confused about white supremacy. Uh, we should be on every day. Uh, replace white supremacy with justice. Immediately, uh, if you think the program's constructive, uh, invest. You can go uh, to the blog dash notes dot blogspot dot com. Uh, my PayPal is right there. Uh, you can also it should be in the description at Talkshoe. Uh, just look in the description. It should say invest in the cows, and there should be a link. You can click it, copy and paste it, and uh, you should be good to go. Uh, you can support Justice as well. Her blog just do justice today dot blogspot dot com just do justice today dot blogspot dot com and uh we'll be back tomorrow. It has been four hours. Man, uh, replace white supremacy with justice and uh if you you know anything, if you listen to the program one thing you should not forget, we need a fundamental change in the way that we see white people. Uh, there's no such thing as a well-meaning, good white person. No such thing as a white person not being racist. It's just not possible. And uh, the quicker that we can accept that and understand that, I think we'll be uh, much better off uh, to replace white supremacy with justice immediately. No such thing as a not racist white person. We'll be back tomorrow. Context of white supremacy signing out. Woo!